Good morning, members, and welcome to this meeting of the Planning Applications Committee on Wednesday, the 27th of October. This meeting is being live streamed and will be made available on the Council's website for public viewing. Could I remind members to follow the good practice guidance, which includes muting microphones and switching off their videos when you're not addressing the meeting. Should you wish to contribute to any item, you should write speak in the Teams chat function, and you will be invited to speak in order about new issues. Should your question or issues be raised by a previous speaker, please withdraw your request so that we can deal with the business as efficiently as possible. The usual standing orders apply, including that any votes will be undertaken by roll call. If any member has to leave the meeting for any reason, can I remind you to either leave the Teams meeting for that period of time, or you could write leave in the Teams chat function and then join. This will allow us to monitor member presence. I will now ask Tracy to confirm the sederant, please, Tracy. Thank you, Chair. We've got 16 members currently present. We've got three members present in person at Council HQ, being the Chair, Councillor Sloan and Councillor Thompson, and we've got 13 members present on Teams. I have apologies from Councillor Dempster, Councillor McGregor, Councillor McClelland and Councillor Tate. And not present at the start of the meeting is Councillor McKee. Thank you, Tracy. I uh, give my approval for remote participation. Uh, I will now ask if there's any declarations of interest. I have two. There's uh, item seven and item 10. I know uh, one representer on each of those items uh, but my interest is as, as such, I will remain in the meeting. So do anyone else have any interest declarations? John Young, Councillor Young, please. Hey, thank you, Chair, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I, too, was, have a personal knowledge of one of the objectors in Agenda Item 7, and I will withdraw for, from the meeting for this particular item. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Young. Uh, Councillor Drysdale. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. I'm going to have to declare an interest in item number four, please, as I was unable to attend the site visit at the time due to family issues, and I haven't been able to attend the site. I was going to attend the site yesterday. I've had quite a lot of correspondence in the matter, so I'm going to I'll sit in if that's okay, Chair, but I won't partake in the debate. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, my understanding is you don't necessarily have to be on a site visit to take part. Is that right, Tracy? Yes, Chair, that's correct. Um, members who attended the previous meeting where the, the item was discussed can participate even if they didn't attend the site visit. And I have a list of those members that I'll read out at the start of that item. Does that help, Pauline? Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks, Tracy. Oh, got a bit of an, an echo here. I just feel I wanted to see the site before I was able to make a decision. And I feel that I did check this actually with governance and, and did discover that if I'd gone myself and done a site visit, it would have helped me. And I just feel because I wasn't able to go and see the site that I'm not able to make a fair decision on it today. So it's a personal decision, Chair, if that's OK. Thanks very much, Pauline. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, it's just on item 10. Um, I feel I should declare an interest insofar as I know the, um, the objector uh, writing on behalf of Moffat Community Council. However, I would say that um, they would be a public person as well and very well known. So I, I, I don't think it would uh, Im impact on my objectivity. So I'll, I'll stay in for that item. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I see David Sutty wants to come in, but I'll ask uh, Councillor McComb. He's on the, the speak. Councillor McComb first. Thank you very much, Chair. With regard to item five, a number of the representers are known to me, but I do not feel that uh, the relationship is sufficiently strong that it would be necessary to avoid participating in the meeting. 
Thanks very much, Councillor McComb. Thank you. Uh, David Sutty, you wish to come in? Thank you, Chair. Morning, members. Uh, so in respect of item eight, I employed the applicant and his father in their capacity as professional decorators some five years ago. But as that's the extent of my knowledge of and involvement with the applicant, I'll remain in my normal role for that item. Thank you very much for that. If there are no more declarations of interest. Uh, the Chair, I've, I've been waiting. Who's that? Councillor? Uh, Andy Ferguson. Oh, Councillor Ferguson. Sorry, did you put your hand up? Uh, no, I, put, I wrote it and speak in the chat. Sorry, I missed, I missed that out in the speak, but uh, yeah, go ahead, Councillor Ferguson. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, like a number of others, uh, I know some of the people uh, for the Kikubri application, but I'll still sit in on it. Um, and I'm also uh, aware, I, I saw Mr. Wilson on there, who I know, and I'm assuming that's a Wigtown one. For some reason, I don't have a list of the, the speakers. Um, I, I, or I can't find him in my email system. Uh, so I'm assuming he's uh, he's on and got an interest in the Wigtown one. But it, my my, um, my knowledge of Mr. Wilson doesn't preclude me. I would suggest uh, sitting in on this application. So it's only for noting purposes, uh, Chair. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Ferguson. But I, th I think there's a list in the chat uh, of all the speakers for today. If anybody wants to have a look at that, they can just go on to the chat. So, uh, bear that in mind, uh, I'll now ask uh, Tracy to outline the procedures to be following at the meeting today. Tracy. I've just been asked uh, if we can uh, go to item three first, which is the, the previous meeting, uh, the, the minutes of the previous meeting of the 28th of September, 2021. This is for approval. Can we have that as an approval? Happy to move. Thank you. Tracy, could you take us out uh, the line of the procedures for today? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The Planning Applications Committee will consider each application in turn as detailed on the agenda. The case officer or the appointed officer will make a short presentation addressing the determining issues accompanied by digital images. Any late information, amendments or corrections will be reported at this time. Members may ask questions of officers following the presentation on points of clarification. The chairman has been provided with a list of eligible representatives who have registered to speak at this meeting within the period specified in council policy and no other persons will be allowed to speak. The Chairman will individually invite those who have registered in advance to speak to make their presentation, after which they may be questioned by committee members. No questions may be asked of members. The order of eligible parties being heard is as follows. Third parties objecting to an application. Third parties supporting an application. Statutory consultees objecting to an application. Elected members of Dumfries and Galloway Council who are not members of the Planning Committee and should withdraw from the meeting after making their presentation, and applicants or their agents. In line with the Coronavirus Scotland Act 2020 Schedule 6 Part 4, covering the exclusion of the public from meetings of local authorities, representatives were offered the option of joining the meeting remotely to deliver their presentation or to provide a written statement to be read out on their behalf. Presentations will be strictly limited to three minutes per person, except for national and major developments, which by their very nature are more complex and where the time limit will be five minutes. The chair of the committee will ask you to come to a conclusion if you take too long. Representers are encouraged to use the time allotted to clarify any points they consider material and address the determining issues. Certain matters are not normally material planning considerations and will not be taken into account by the council when deciding on a planning application. Representatives should not raise any new matters without explaining why they were not raised earlier with the case officer. Please do not repeat what is in the report, as members will have already read the report. After all the representations have been heard, the meeting is then in formal session and no members may address the committee. The Planning Applications Committee will then proceed to, to determine the application. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much. Uh, Tracy, before I move on to agenda item four, I'll just ask Tracy if she would give us a list of who can actually take part. This is a continuation 
after a deferral for a site visit. Tracy. Yeah, those members who can participate in this item are the Chair, Councillor Blake, Councillor Crothers, Councillor Drybra, Councillor Fairbairn, Councillor Ferguson, Councillor Justy, Councillor McComb, Councillor Maitland, Councillor Martin, Councillor Sloan, Councillor Thompson and Councillor Young. Thank you very much, Tracy. So, moving on to agenda item four, which is the erection of a dwelling house and formation of access and car parking at land adjoining Pinehurst, Tongland, Kirkubri. The case officer is Judith Turnbull. Do we have Judith with us? Chair. Who's that? It's John Martin here. Uh, I, if this, if this, sorry, if this was brought at the last meeting, if this uh, was on the agenda at the last meeting, I was not at the last meeting. It wasn't the last meeting. I think it was in August, Councillor Martin. Was it? Oh, sorry, that's fine. That's fine. I mean, we've got a list of names. Uh, um, I mean, your name was mentioned, so you can take part. Are you happy with that, Councillor Martin? This was from the 25th of August meeting, John. Aye, um, the last meeting was the 28th of September that you weren't aye, present, so aye, you can that's participate. Fine, that's, fine, that's fine, Tracy. Thanks, John. Uh, right, uh, case officer is uh, Judith Turnbull. Judith, have we got you on yes. Teams? Hi, Judith, yes. good morning. Good morning, uh, thank you. I would like to ask you if you, to take members through any of the points that was raised at the site visit, please. That yes. would uh, help those who didn't attend as well. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chairman. Do you want me to run through the presentation quickly, though? If it doesn't take too long, yeah, please. Um, OK, I'll just, I'll just make it quick. Um, the site visit took place on the 8th of October um, and we, we had a, a quick look, look around the site um, and up into the Pinehurst um, gar garden as well. Um, I'll just quickly run through the slides. Um, if we go on to the first slide, please. This is, this is the location plan um, adjacent to Monk's Way, the U44, uh, leading down from the A711. Um, next slide. Yeah, this shows the fish house to the northeast of the site, um, and Pinehurst um, adjacent to the A711 up up at the top. Um, moving on quickly, this is the existing block plan and sections. Um, it shows the the area for siting the dwelling house, an existing biodis system, and the fish house in the bottom of the site there as well. Um, moving on to the proposed block plan. The dwelling house is located on an excavated and retained area. Um, the parking arrangement for the fish house has changed and a result of, as a result of the location of the biodis system, but the roads department are satisfied with the arrangement. Uh, if we could go on to the elevations, floor, floor roof plan and sections. Um, when we were on site, we had a look at the, you know, it was evident to members about the excavation that had taken place. And in terms of the excavation, there's a little more required to come out at the car park, car parking area. But apart from that, there's no additional excavation would be required. Um, moving on to the the, the last um, plan image, it's just to clarify that that the area outlined, you know, coloured in in the yellow, is the area of land that is associated with the fish house, which is currently up for sale. Um, moving on quickly to the slides. This is the um, view from the, the bottom of the U44S public road. The, the dwelling house would be located on the left-hand side there. Um, the track you can see going up, continuing up, moving on. This is the view north of us. <laughs> um, view north over the site. Uh, that's the fish house in the distance there. Next one is looking back down the track, the area of the site and the dwelling house is indicated. On to the next slide. This is the ice house, which is in the banking. There's a couple of conditions. 
attached to the recommendation um, for works to the ice house. Um, this is the waste water treatment area, which has been completed and enclosed. Next one, please. This is the view from the top of the banking onto the, the area of the site that we can see. The parking area for the at the bottom of the U44 S is, is in is on the right hand side of that image, and the other houses in the area visible beyond. Um, the next slide is just a, to give you a flavour of the other dwelling houses in the vicinity. So to summarise, the, the, the application is, is recommended for approval uh, subject to conditions. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you very much, uh, Judith. Uh, much appreciate that. So, members, we are in session, and the recommendation is to approve subject to conditions. Members, I'm open to debate. I have a proposal from Councillor Sloan to agree the recommendation. Uh, whose hands are that? Councillor Dryborough. Yes, uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, I think, um, you know, I don't have a problem, but I, I, I do perhaps maybe see uh, an opportunity to enhance um, one of the recommendations, if that is, if that is uh, opportune. The, the in, in, in recommendation to no development in respect of this plan shall take place unless until a scheme detailing new shrub and shrub planting and have landscaping has been submitted to. I mean, the, the members that attended will have seen the the steepness of that particular bank at the back of the at the back of the the the, the placement the, the planned area for the house. And I, I wonder, Chair, if it would be appropriate. And, and I'm, I'm looking for you know officer um, uh, advice here if some form of of underpinning would be appropriate in this particular place. Um, and, and that is the, the, the big lumps of, you know, the, the caged concrete and things like that. Um, I, I, I'm happy, I mean, I'm happy to give it, but just in, in the recommendations and under the condition do to have some form of landscaping that would um, reduce the chance of the fall potentially uh, off, the, off that backslide, please. Thank you, Councillor Dryborough. Uh, Judith, uh, I wonder if you can assist... Uh... Uh, Councillor Dryborough, uh, on condition two, uh, I did visit myself and it did seem a bit steep, uh, so maybe that's a, a concern that members have. Thank you, Judith. Um, yeah, I did clarify this with the agent um, about the banking and um, I believe it's mostly rock. Now, in terms of, of putting forward some sort of stabilising measures, you know, would you be looking for some sort of retaining wall or something to stabilise the banking higher than that? I mean, Archie? It, yeah, it, when you underpin something, it's about holding back anything that potentially could fall down. And, and, and at the side of, you know, at the side of some of these buildings, you get these big blocks, caged blocks of stones, which allow, you know, the, the to stop the falling of any slate. And it is soft rock that's actually behind in, in the in, in the in the um the hill that's behind the, the, the actual site. So it'd be sort of um large caged rocks, uh, probably maximum too high um to, to stop the, the fall of any any potential. Um Judith I think the this Gabian baskets you're referring to um well, well we, done, Judith. Um, we could we could perhaps put in a condition um, asking for gabion baskets. I imagine they're about a metre high. I'm not. I don't know exactly, but if they're a metre high, then would you want you know a run of about of two of those, and we could put them in the the final details to be agreed. If that sounds okay. I mean, I, th I think I think one would be enough if it's a metre high. Um, one sort of uh, along along the back of that that particular thing would be fine. I'll just bring in uh, David Sutty to speak on that one, uh, Archie, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank David. you, Chair. 
just looking at the wording of condition two, I think it's it's requiring a further scheme to be submitted. So there is capacity within this condition where it is looking for details of changes of existing levels, hard surfacing walls, which obviously includes things like gaping baskets, fences and other means of enclosure, formation of banks, terraces and other earthworks. So I think that is actually quite quite well covered by the wording of condition two anyway. But if um, if members are happy, I'm quite happy to go and have a look again at that wording and just be explicit about details being required for the whatever it is the western elevation uh, in terms of the need for any gabion baskets or others thank you that's been helpful I'd, david archie you want to come back in yeah i'd be happy with that chair thanks very much uh, i'm reading that condition i mean it's, it does uh, mention formation of banks uh, terraces or other earthworks so we, we if we can just strengthen that with the word in that would probably satisfy members, I would imagine. Uh, I have uh, Councillor Young next. Councillor Young. Hey, thanks, Chair. Um, I've got a much simpler solution. I think we should refuse this application. I, I believe this is quite a historic site, and this development, I believe, personally, is contrary to our policy OP1 in terms of historic environments. And I'll just quote from the development. Development proposals should protect or enhance the character, appearance and setting of the region's rich historic environment, principally by ensuring they are sympathetic to nearby, nearby buildings, sites and features, integrate well and complement the surrounding area. This, this development does not do that, and I believe this is quite a historic part of Tomland. So I, I would propose that we go against the officer's recommendation with this particular item. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Young. So we have a proposal to refuse the application. Councillor Maitland, you're next. Sorry, struggling to find the, the right button. Um, Chairman, I thought that the site visit was helpful. I think it opened members' eyes as to the constriction of the site and um, and and showed us um, what what the, the the general situation was. But I've got some questions, please, um, as far as the conditions are concerned. Have we actually covered paragraph thirty one, which is the archaeologists' concerns? Um, paragraph thirty one or three point one whatever it is, um, is talking about um, making certain that um, that we cover PAN 2 2011, um, whether whether the um, any works will be properly um, uh, supervised. Um, next question I have is about physical planning. It's very constrained, and it is still not clear to me whether the site itself can accommodate the council's usual requirements for parking and turning, and whether or not the site itself has to accommodate those two things. I, I, I'm not absolutely clear about that. The next, the next question I have um, concerns whether or not we will have a problem with land use conflict if people attempted to park on what is a right of way, whether our conditions make that clear that that's not appropriate. I'm not yet absolutely clear about whether I think this is um, entirely in line with our planning um, requirements, but I wonder if you could possibly help me with those questions to start with. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Maitland. Uh, Judith, can you assist Councillor Maitland with those questions, please? Um, I'll try my best. Um, the archaeologist response um, was no objection subject, subject to conditions. Um, and the, the conditions I picked up from that were that the mortar matches the existing and that no um, 
works have been to be done to the the gates of the ice house without without um, being previous uh, approved beforehand. Um, so so that was that's what I've done in in relation to the archaeologist um, with response to parking and turning. Um, we we got the the consultation response from the roads department and they were happy with the arrangement. The biodisc system was put in and that meant that one of the parking spaces for the fish house had to be changed. So the roads department were consulted again and they were happy with the arrangement. I think there's actually parking for, for two cars up at the fish house um, now so and a, and a turning area in the in the nearest near this near this proposed dwelling house but roads were happy about that um so i've just gone gone with their their advice um with regard to the right of way um condition five refers to that um that the public right of way along the eastern boundary of the application shall be maintained free from obstruction and kept open to users for the lifetime of the development, um, the linking track from the new 44S up to the A711-3. So that's that's where I am on that. Thanks, Judith. That's been helpful for me. Uh, I don't know if it's assisted Councillor Maitland, but we can maybe come back to that one. Uh, I have Ian Carruthers uh, on the chat, and uh, just before I bring Ian in, uh, I see David Sutty wants to come in. Maybe he can clear up some of the, the points that have been made. David? Uh, actually, I didn't. That, that was just the, the previous point. Um, so, no, I, I haven't done anything to add to what you said, actually. I think uh, what you said is fine from my perspective. Thanks very much, David. Uh, Councillor Carruthers. Thanks, yeah. Uh, Mr. City answered my uh, point. Uh, I think it was appropriate what you said. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I don't see any other people wishing to come in or make points or references in the debate. I, I have a motion put forward by Councillor Young, which is to refuse. Do you have a seconder for that motion? I'm quite happy to second Councillor Young's motion. Uh, thanks very much. The motion, uh, the motion was actually uh, to go with the recommendation, which was from Councillor Sloan. Thank you. And the amendment uh, would have been Councillor Young. So uh, uh, are you still going with uh, the amendment, Councillor Maitland? I wasn't here that Councillor Seconder. Apologies, uh, I left my mic on. I couldn't make out what you were saying. I'll switch it off. Right. Well, I, I'll, I'm quite happy to go with governance. Um, and uh, my suggestion is that I will support a refusal. So you need to tell me whether that is a motion or an amendment. I don't mind. It would be an amendment because Councillor Sloan did actually say at the beginning that uh, he would go with the recommendations. So that would be the motion, I would think. Is that right, or, or unless somebody seconds the motion, does that become the motion? Right, thank you, Tracy. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, I was going to just second the Councillor Sloan's proposal. Um, so, whichever order that's in, I don't know. In terms of governance, if it's you know, in order to make it seconded, so it can be carried forward. I don't know if it's the motion or the amendment, but whichever it is, I'd, I'm happy to go with the recommendations in the report. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Uh, so I think we've kind of cleared that one up. Uh, but Tracy, please uh, inform us what's the motion and what's the amendment. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I think because you, you were already in the process of speaking to Councillor Maitland and Councillor Young, that's why they got in for. But I will accept that Councillor Sloan is the motion and Stephen Thompson has seconded the motion to approve the application as per the report. And that's with David looking to check on the wording for the condition, if you'd be happy to accept that as part of their motion. 
Happy and to accept that's part of your motion. And the amendment proposed by Councillor Young, seconded by Councillor Maitland, is to refuse the application on the grounds that the proposal is contrary to LDP policy OP1, that it does not protect and or enhance the character, appearance and setting of the region's rich historic environment, principally by ensuring that they are sympathetic to nearby building sites and features and does not integrate well with the, with the surrounding area. Thank you very much. We we'll just go to the, to the vote. vote. Chairman. Motion. Councillor Blake. Motion. Councillor Crothers. Motion. Councillor Drybra. Motion. Councillor Fairbairn. Motion. Councillor Ferguson. Amendment. Councillor Justy. Motion. Councillor McComb. Councillor McComb. I think he may have left us something. Amendment. Thank you. Councillor Maitland. Amendment. Councillor Martin. Motion. Councillor Sloan. Motion. Councillor Thompson. Motion. And Councillor Young. Amendment. And the motion carries nine votes to four, so the application has been approved, subject to the conditions detailed in the report. Thank you very much, uh, Tracy. Uh, we now move on to, oh, and thank you, Judith, for your, your report. We'll now move on to agenda item five. This is an erection of 43 dwelling houses, formation of access, internal road layout, associated parking areas and landscaping at Southfield, Wigton. The application number is 19 stroke 1383 stroke full. Uh, and its recommendation is to approve subject to A, the successful completion of a section 75 planning obligation within six months of the date of the decision or other such reasonable extended time scale as agreed by the appointed officer and B, the conditions. And here to give the report is Chris McTeer, the case officer. Chris, are you with us? Morning, Chair. Uh, morning, members. Yes, I am. Uh, can we have the first slide, please? Okay, so the uh, application today uh, is in front of members uh, by virtue of being major development under the uh, hierarchy of development regulations. And in addition to that, there has been six uh, or more separate uh, timeless objections uh, to, uh, to the application. Uh, next slide, please. So the application site uh, is located in central Wigtown um, and comprises an area uh, of a former show field. Uh, it's currently uh, designated in LDP2 for housing and comprises uh, allocated housing sites WG, TH1 and H2. Um, the site's well contained uh, with a clear boundary formed by a traditional stone wall. Uh, the northern boundary of the site uh, comprises a belt of mature trees which uh, forms the, uh, the edge of Wigton uh, conservation area. Um, I'll just walk through some, uh, some photographs of the site. So can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so um, starting at the, uh, at the top of the site along the northern boundary, this is Southfield Lane. Um, and you can see to the left of the, uh, the picture here is uh, part, of the, uh, part of the existing uh, stone wall and mature trees. Uh, next slide. This is just a little bit further uh, down the road. There is a, an existing entrance uh, to the left here. Uh, two more gated entrances are proposed um, further, down, uh, further down the road here. Next slide. So this is a view of the site looking from the north to the south. Um, so as you can see, it's, uh, it's a clear open area. Next slide. 
And this is just from further down uh, down the road. Now, what you see in here is uh, the remains of something I think may have been uh, may have been a toilet once. Um, certainly, a, a small um, building which was uh, which was attached to the uh, to the boundary wall um, since been demolished. Next slide. So moving around from Southfield Lane, this is the top of Southfield Lane, looking down the western boundary of the site. There is an existing access here, uh, and you can see it's uh, it's a fairly well used uh, footpath into the site. Next slide. And this is further down um, Southfield Lane into Lilico Loaning, uh, and you can see part of the uh, part of the boundary wall here is uh, comprised of slightly more modern brick. Um, this particular um, section of wall um, is proposed to be uh, taken down and a replacement one metre high uh, wall put in place with um, pedestrian accesses into uh, the proposed housing units, uh, this particular part of the site. Uh, next slide. So this is looking from the south of the site, looking back north. So uh, the houses that you see in the uh, in the picture there are the ones on Southfield Lane. Next slide. This is just panning across the site back to the north. So the trees in the background are the northern boundary. Next slide. Again, this is just a uh, view to the south. So the um, what you're seeing just beyond the uh, the small dry stone wall there with uh, with the old tree in there, the uh, the suds is going to be located just uh, just in there. Next slide. So proposed entrance from the sea view um, side of the site. So this is down at the south. So the road uh, would continue into the site just uh, in the, the rear of the, the photograph there. Next slide. OK, this is us on to Harbour Street, uh, which is the eastern boundary of the site. And you can see this is the, uh, the existing uh, entrance into the site, which uh, obviously would be upgraded. Next slide. And again, this is looking across the site from east to west. Next slide. OK, so this is looking from the east. The uh, the building that you see there with uh, the, the tall uh, chimneys is the old prison house, uh, which is a B listed building. Next slide. <coughs> And so this is looking. Uh, this is looking. It actually says from the east. It's actually looking from the west towards um, towards Harbour Street. So it's, it should be viewed to the east, uh, which shows the uh, the land levels dropping down slightly from uh, from the north to the south. Next slide. And again, that just illustrates the uh, the drop in site levels uh, to to Harbour Street there. Next slide. OK, so I've uh, included some house types uh, with uh, with the presentation. I haven't included all of the house types. Um, some are uh, minor variations with uh, things like additional porches uh, to them. But uh, there is a proposed mix of uh, house types on the site. So there are some uh, semi-detached, some terraced and some detached uh, dwellings. Next slide, please. Um, this house type A+. Plus. Um, so the houses are proposed to be finished in render with uh, feature cladding and masonry depending on the type. Uh, roof finished in concrete tiles, uh, black UPVC rainwater goods and painted timber windows and doors. Uh, next slide, please. Um, that's house type B. And the next slide, please. It's, uh, that's just a single story unit. Next slide. Uh, this shows one of the uh, one of the detached dwelling houses, and the next slide is similar. Oh, that's house type F for that one. Um, apologies, my camera's gone off. I hope you can all still hear me. Um, I don't know why my camera's gone off. It's just uh, decided it's not playing ball. Uh, so apologies. <laughs> Might not be a bad thing if you can't see me. Um, next slide, please. Um, 
what I've done is, uh, given the proximity of the uh, conservation area to the north of the application site, I've uh, included some images uh, of existing developments in the surrounding area. So just to give a, a sort of view of the uh, the mix of housing uh, sort of types and designs that sort of border the uh, border the site. So this is uh, off Southfield Lane. So this is to the west of the site. Just an example of uh, some slightly slightly more modern housing. Uh, next slide, please. And again, that's just looking down the uh, the western uh, boundary of the site. Next slide. This is just uh, back to the, uh, the the south of the site where the proposed entrance is going to be. Um, the house types down or, or located around about the south of the site are uh, what you would call formal, formal local authority housing. Uh, the next slide, please. This should be us to the east. This is uh, down the bottom of uh, Harbour Road. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And the next slide, please. Okay, that's us. Um, so overall, the uh, the development is considered acceptable uh, and in line with uh, LDP2 policies and adopted supplementary guidance. And for the reasons set out in the report, uh, it's recommended that members approve this application today. Um, just a, a final mention, I had um, a very uh, brief email discussion with uh, David Sutty before the, uh, the committee started. Um, condition six uh, in the recommended conditions um, is to uh, is to get a scheme uh, given the details of uh, walls, fences, boundary enclosures. Um, we feel that that probably needs to be beefed up to uh, to include the existing uh, boundary wall, which uh, although we've mentioned it in uh, although I've mentioned it in the report, um, we think needs to be uh, needs to be added into condition six uh, just to. Uh, to beef that up a little bit, um, but that's uh, obviously for uh, for members to decide on. Um, so yeah, that's uh, my my conclusion uh, for this application. Uh, my presentation's done, and I'm happy to take questions from members. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Chris. Yeah, uh, that was one of my observations. Was in uh, 4.6, it mentions about the medieval carved stonework. Uh, I'm quite pleased to see that that. Condition six will be beefed up. So questions to the case officer. Whose hand have we got up there? Right, uh, the, I've just been told that the hand that's shown is the objector, but they can't come in at the moment. So this is just for members only. Questions to the case officer. Councillor Maitland. Um, I, I want to thank um, <coughs> Chris very much for his, um, his his photographs of the surrounding area because um, I thought that was useful. Um, I was looking at the palette that they were proposing to use. I mean, I, I think the designs are really um, very pleasant and I think the size of houses are reasonably generous um, and, and altogether I think it's um, it's looking looking good. But um, they do introduce red tiled roofs and I just wondered, Chris, if... Um, if Wigton was known for having red tiled roofs elsewhere, because I couldn't spot any in the photographs that you showed me. Um, so I wonder if um, if you have any thoughts about that. Chris? Um, it's a good question, Councillor Maitland. Um, I suppose the short answer is no. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's nothing really um, in the surrounding area. I did take a good, um, a good sort of long walk round about um, Wigton, uh, it's somewhere that I've, uh, I've I've never really been, despite being uh, a, <laughs> a local, shall we say, of uh, of Dumfries and Galloway. So that's uh, part of the perks of the job, I suppose, um, as I get to go out and see these. Um, I, I suppose, in in, in fairness, a, a darker colour would probably um, would probably complement the, uh, the, the 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 wider area. But um, given that it is it is quite a self-contained uh, development, um, it would be a it would be. A, uh, I, I suppose they would all be seen together. Um, condition 13 of uh, of the proposal, uh, of the yeah. So 
it does require the uh, the external finishes to be um, sort of finally agreed on. Um, so yeah, I suppose we could uh, we could we could look at that one um, again if, uh, if 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 that were uh, something that members wanted to to take on board. Thanks, Chris. Councillor Maitland, uh, does that help you at all? It was just a question about what was there in the rest of the area. Yeah, uh, I mean, if uh, members are quite strong, I suppose we could attach that uh, to that particular condition later on uh, when we're in session. Uh, I don't see... Oh, sorry, uh, Councillor McComb, you wish to come in? Please, Chair. Chair, I'm looking at condition 17, that retained trees will be protected unless otherwise agreed with the council. Do you feel this provides sufficient protection and is the level of protection similar to that afforded by a TPO? Chris? Um, uh, taking the second uh, part of your question uh, first, uh, yes, um, it, if, if it's if it's protected by condition, it is effectively the same um, as a as a TPO. Um, I know that there is a um, a provisional TPO proposed for um, trees within the site. Obviously, um, you know the, the the bulk of the trees that are listed uh, in in the site plan. Um, are along the northern boundary. I think there's, uh, there's 17 trees um, along the, the, the northern boundary. Uh, the plan indicates that five uh, are to be removed, although it looks like uh, they are some of the slightly smaller ones um, to, you know, to, to, to be taken out. Certainly the, uh, the, the, the larger, um, more mature ones um, would, uh, would, would, would be kept in. Um, so condition 17 is, is, is really just to, uh, to you know, to... to to provide some protection for um, the, the, the the trees that are there. Uh, obviously, it forms the, the boundary of the conservation area, um, and it is something that we would very much uh, like to be kept um, to, to be kept there. So, yeah, we we, we, we feel that that's um, that that's that, that's the best way to to do it is, um, is 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 by condition. I don't think it needs a, an additional TPO. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, uh, Councillor McComb. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Thanks, Chair. Um, I will firstly pleased to see Condition 19. I think that'll be the start of a trend. I'm sure members will welcome about having the ducting um, for housing developments. Uh, but the question actually relates to um, developer contributions, particularly around health facilities, which I've asked the question before, and I'm sure David City is aware of this, but. Uh, Obviously, with a development like this, you've got 43 new households, um, and you know one of the primary concerns of the objectors in this case was about the open space, uh, which has um, obviously been addressed in the report. Um, and there's also the calculation about the um, impact on schools, which which we see in the reports. But we never really see any clear mechanism for contributions towards, um, or how even a contribution would be made towards uh, health facilities. Um, and I'm noticing in the objections that were recorded on page 47 and 48 in the report. Um, it talks about a 10% increase in the number of houses in Wigton, which is deemed, uh, thought to be excessive, and then also that it would um, lead to a dramatic increase in the demand for local services. Now, I appreciate that development by its nature will do that, but it's, it's really about how do we then um, enable the respective services to do it to be developed in order to provide for that increase. And um, I've, I've yet to see one which sets out how we would do that for health service provision. So I'm just sort of wondering, it's more of a general point, I appreciate that, but just while we're, we've got officers here for this part of the debate, um, would is there an answer for that one? Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Thompson. Chris, can you assist uh, Councillor Thompson? Uh, probably in so much as uh, swerving this one to uh, to David, uh, health facilities are um, are noted in policy OP3 um, as a as a, as part of a community um, facility. Um, as as officers with with new development, we tend to we do tend to focus on things like affordable housing 
open space and education uh, contributions, obviously um, notwithstanding uh, the rest of, uh, of of the list of uh, you know things that are, are relative to, to to policy OP3. Um, it, it is a very good point, um, and I, I think I might just ask uh, David if he's got any any more thoughts on that one. David. Nicely squared, Chris. Um, it is a very chewy one. Uh, I've lived in settlements in the past where there was a planning obligation on the development to actually put uh, health facilities in for what was effectively like a, a mini new town. Um, the difficulty was that the developer was able to provide that, but it sat vacant for years because the health board didn't actually want to put something in. Um, it is a really tricky one. I it is in there. It allows us to have it. So, for example, somewhere like Marchfield, where you, you've got a very substantial part of your land release, you could actually require a similar thing to go in there. I'm not sure it is proportionate to uh, a scheme for 43 houses. Um, and as I say, the, the real difficulty is actually trying to get it implemented because it wouldn't be the council's planning authority that would actually be, or the developer indeed, that would be going in there with healthcare facilities. It would be NHS. And if NHS has not indicated to us that they um, would object to a proposal on the basis that there was insufficient healthcare facilities in the area, it becomes very difficult for us to insist on it. So it, it's not an easy one, it's a short answer to that one. Uh, things such as education, affordable housing are the more regular ones and the ones which are certainly far more tangible on the ground. Thanks, David. Stephen, you wanted to come back in? Yeah, just very quickly. No, thanks, and I appreciate that. And it's, 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 I think I've had the similar answer before when I've asked, but I, th I think it's more about maybe behind the scenes what the mechanism is to... I, I don't see an NHS response as part of a consultee response within the report so it would be hard to know how they would know about it or what they felt about it um, or indeed how much it would impact on their services knowing that it would be in this case 43 households which might be a small number in the big scheme of things but it all adds up so um, maybe it's something I can pick up offline at a later time um, so I'll defer to other members thank you chair thanks councillor Thompson maybe something we could pick up on the LDP3 <laughs> later on uh, I've got uh, councillor Young Thanks, Chair. And uh, like Councillor Thompson, I'm very pleased to see ducting for charging included in this. This must be a developer's dream, 43 uh, new houses in such a well-defined site. But they are very traditional and there's nothing really exciting about them. Um, I know it's probably building control that um, governs the insulation in these properties and it's not a planning matter. But I, I would have loved to have seen some solar panels on these properties. And once again, can we ask the developer to consider digital connectivity at a very early stage? But I suppose with these houses, it's, it's more a comment that each individual house here will have your traditional gas central heating. There's nothing modern about this development. It's all very traditional. It doesn't take into account the type of climate concerns we have at the moment. So it, it is all in all a bit disappointing, to be quite honest. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Young. Uh, I wonder if Chris, do you want to respond to any of that? Um, yeah, just um, as, a, as, a, as a very um, sort of a, a more general uh, point. Uh, obviously, this um, this this application has been in um, a little while now. But what we have uh, done, and I'm sure um, members are aware that uh, one of the one of the things that we that we look at as part of policy OP1. Um, is at part OP1F, uh, which is to do with um, with sustainability. Um, we've just recently, uh, members have recently adopted a new supplementary guidance, um, which supports uh, carbon reduction uh, in emissions uh, through uh, all new buildings having to uh, demonstrate that a proportion of uh, the carbon emissions uh, are, are taken into into consideration. So what what's happening from from now on, and it is it has only just been within the last sort of few weeks that we've uh, that we've looked at this, um, is that sort of from this point forward, when we're having developments such as this, and even for developments for single houses, we're looking for an energy statement which uh, demonstrates the use of uh, of low carbon technology. But that's in conjunction with building standards as well. So. 
we're kind of picking up um, the the sort of the the, the, the low carbon systems, be it um, heat pumps, solar um, use of materials um, within the actual build itself. So we are picking those up um, earlier in the in the process, and it is something that we will take into uh, into consideration. But as I say, that that's that's a more sort of general point uh, going forward from from now. Um, appreciating that this application came in before um, we uh, we adopted that particular piece of uh, of supplementary guidance. Thanks. That's been very helpful, Chris, and obviously something for the future. I hope that's kind of slightly satisfied you, Councillor Young. <laughs> uh, I've got Councillor Ferguson and Councillor McComb. Uh, Councillor Ferguson first, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I, without hearing the rest of the debate, obviously, and the rest of the evidence, um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep my counsel in what way I think we should go here. But I'm, I'm a wee bit disappointed, though, Chris, that there's, there's no houses in here for people with disability. They're not general houses. Um, and... Uh, you know, it's a significant number. Um, but just to go back to a point earlier that Council, uh, Councillor Thompson made and David touched on, David will remember that at a seminar I, I asked that we should be talking to the IGB and the Health Social Care Partnership about what their housing needs are um, for the inclusion in uh, uh, um, uh, the third iteration of our current plan. Um, because what we're effectively doing here is building a desert without any chemist, doctor surgery, um, and there's a current GP surgery. Because remember, they're not the NHS, they're private contractors. Um, how, uh, how do we get the message across here from uh, to the Health Social Care Partnership, not the NHS, because the, uh, the housing part of it and the and that would lie with the partnership rather than the NHS on their own. So that means we are actually partners. So I think the question for me is, how are, how are we actually talking as, as a planning uh, department to uh, our colleagues in the Health and Social Care Partnership, many of whom are council employees? Uh, thanks, Andy. I think we might be straying into something that's not uh, in the report. Obviously, the, these will be uh, considered I'm sure in the future, and these are probably things that we could add to the LDP3 when it comes along, or, or members can have their say in that. Uh, I don't know if you want to respond to any of that, Chris. Uh, I think some of those points are uh, slightly above my pay grade for uh, for that one, but they're, they're very valid points, um, and it, it could be something that we pick up um, in, in terms of how we we'll look at applications in the future um, as, as part of, of LDP3. Thanks very much. Uh, Councillor McComb. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of points of local information. Wigtown has no mains gas supply. The town is totally dependent upon electricity. With regard to uh, health services, the local surgery in the past was more heavily utilised and no doubt if the demand materialised could be used more heavily in the future. Thanks, uh, Councillor McComb. Again, it, the, these are the points that have been raised before uh, by other members, and uh, it's obviously a discussion for another day, I, I would suggest. If I've got no more uh, members coming in for questions to the case officer, we'll move on to the uh, representers. I have five statements to be read out and an objector and the agent via teams so tracy if you would uh, like to start with uh, the first objector which is michelle acton thank you tracy thanks chair i strongly object to the proposed development on the following grounds one the proposed development is significantly too large for wigtown 
It represents approximately a 10% increase in the number of housing units. Not only will there be significant pressures on waste, water, road traffic and parking to the detriment of existing residents and visitors, but frankly, the development will ruin the unique peace, beauty and ambience of Wigtown, which so many of us enjoy. Two, the proposed designs of the units do not relate to the character and form of Wigtown. Having seen the plans, the proposed designs show no sensitivity to the historic nature of the town. Wigtown relies heavily on tourism for income. Development should not be allowed that damage its character and undermine its economic activity. Three, the proposed number of units is severely lessens the open space available for the benefit of Wigtown residents. The showfield's history, even since it was sold by the council, has been an open space for the benefit of all. It is currently well used by residents as it is at the centre of the town. Take this away and many residents would not be able to access such open space. And four, I strongly object to proposed units 41, 42 and 43. These sit close to the boundary with Harbour Road and will overlook my house and garden. These properties have windows facing my house and I object to such intrusion. This will also block the light coming into my house, particularly in the late afternoon and the evening. You just want to carry on with uh, Laura Mustin, please, Tracy. With reference to the plan by 3B to erect 43 houses at the old showfield at Southfield Park, I wish to raise my objection. This dense development would spoil what has always been public amenity land, initially as the showfield for the Wigtonshire Agricultural Society, laterally as welcome open space for dog walking and recreation. Recent events have proven how essential accessible green space is to the mental and physical health of us all. Once lost, this park can never be restored. The environmental standards suggest for the construction felt weak at the time that they were first proposed. Now, when still more strands are required in order to meet the obligations to reverse climate change, they must fail dismally. It will be a shame were this historic town to be locked into a development at its heart that was inappropriate and shoddy, and surely this needs to be thought again, and I therefore urge you to reject this application. Thank you, Tracy. Could you now read out Mr and Mrs Spencer Smith's statement, please? There are one or two points which I want to comment and make an objection to. One, it is stated that the walls surrounding the showground are in dangerous state and some need to be demolished. There are walls in similar condition found all over Wigtown. I have them myself around my house and there was no difficulty in having them repaired. Although if you're only looking at it from the cost point of view, it would probably be cheaper to knock the walls down and not worry about how much it would change this area for the worse instead of saving this historic history of Wigtown. It would take very little time for everything to be seen to and repaired. These walls are part of the overall fabric and look of our town. They will be found all over Wigtown and Wigtonshire. They are part of the heritage which must be preserved and the wall that is shown in such a way that it appears to be collapsing is misleading as the damage to the wall has been taken over the course, I think it is, of 18 to 36 months up to today's date and was caused by youths taking it down one stone at a time. Two, the roads. South Back Street is far too dangerous to be used and is exit from the showground as it runs north into Southfield Lane, which is only wide enough for one car at a time, and there is no pavement for pedestrians. Going south along South Back Street into Lithical Loaning, you come into another area where lots of cars park and children play. You will be putting children and adults' lives at risk. An exit leading into Harbour Road will also cause similar difficulties. Cars park up and down this road, many because they have nowhere else to go. Their houses having no drive or garage. At the southern end of this road is very dangerous narrow road bend used by many people on foot and by car. If this development went ahead, the number of cars using exits would be as many as 86, working on two cars per household, which is what most households now have. And this is the amount of cars, this adds to the amount of cars who already use this road, which has existing problems. You also have to take into account the heavy goods lorries that use the road from the council to private hauliers and essential services. Three, I think that from an environmental point of view, no trees should be felled just for the sake of it and they are in the way. And the bats, owls that frequently, 
frequent this ground are treated with the greatest of care. Uh, four, I think that the whole scale of this, of what is being proposed, is too much. I cannot see that there is a need for housing when we have many for sale in all prices and houses and more with footings already in place and just left, no doubt, until there is demand. I certainly do not want to overlook a part started building site with houses which will be impossible to sell as the buyers will need jobs and those are few and far away. Five, I think the whole development is badly thought out. The previous plan for 30 houses was also excessive. There is no demand for the development of so many houses which will alter the whole of Wigtown. Wigtown is a beautiful town to live in, full of wonderful, friendly, caring people and I think a development such as this takes very little notice to what happens to the town or the people. Thank you, Tracy. And the next objector is Nick Walker. Could you read out your statement, please? I believe this development, if approved and delivered, will have a substantial negative impact on the local community. The scale of the development is excessive, increasing the number of dwellings in Wigtown by 10%. This risks significantly altering the feel of the town and is bound to impact negatively on local infrastructure. In particular, already very stretched health and education services will be placed under significant additional strain and the wastewater treatment services likewise. Already the sewage system drainage discharges particularly treated waste into the Balnock River and Wigtown Bay at times of heavy rainfall and there appears to be no confirmation that Scottish water can accommodate waste from another 43 dwellings. The sewage treatment unit is in a flood risk area and is therefore unlikely to be readily stable for expansion. Environmental impact could be significant, therefore including the local nature reserve and a sensitive salmon river. This sits poorly within the local authority's climate emergency declaration and its impact on the interpretation of all council policies. Lastly, the site has a long heritage as part of a borough land and was the site of Wigton Agricultural Show for well over a century. It holds a special place in the history of the town and in the last couple of decades has been well used parkland, the loss of which to private households and gardens will be a detriment of local residents. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tracy. And the final statement is from Kevin Witt. If you could read that out, please. I object to the proposed housing development of 43 houses on Southfield Park in Wigtown on the following grounds. The proposed development of 43 houses represents a 10% increase in the number of housing units in Wigtown. This disproportionate development will have a significant impact on wastewater sewage treatment plant, road traffic parking, refuse and emergency services, and already reduced GP service and the primary school. The development will also reduce the usable open, spa open green space available to the residents of Wigtown. I presume that the Council will be taking full consideration and responsibility for all the aforementioned strains on the, local, on the locality and its residents when making their final decision. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tracy. Uh, the next objector is via Teams. We have Andrew Wilson. Are you with us, Andrew? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Uh, because this is a major uh, mm -hmm. planning application, you have five minutes. Okay. Uh, and uh, I will say about 30 seconds before your five minutes is up uh, to bring okay. your presentation to a close. So you can start <coughs> that anytime, please. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much for allowing me to take part. Um, I principally want to say to highlight the um, destruction of uh, a historic open space area and recreation. Um, if you notice from Mr. McTeer's photographs, when they built Sea View, they did it below um, the former show field. And that the, the Wigton show, at, before my time here, but took place uh, in that on that site for a long time. And they did so because it was part of the historic common lands of Wigton. Uh, somehow, when the Wigton show moved to its present site, I believe about 30 years ago, um, the land came into the ownership of the Barr family. Um, five years ago, uh, a group of us got together to set up the Wigton and Blydner uh, Community Initiative and our aim was 
to bring the um, old show field back into community ownership. Uh, and we had to prove our case most rigorously to the Scottish Government and have public consultation, um, surveys and feedback forms, etc. And we, we had evidence that the community was strongly behind us bringing the, that area back into community ownership. And our plans included keeping all the trees at the top, because that would be a community woodland, keeping the, a, a, a big area uh, uh, open space, which would include w w in our plans um, uh, for so events could take place and also um, a grass creek area for car parking, the event space in the grass creek parking would, we anticipated, be a big benefit to the Wigton Book Festival because, uh, as you're probably aware, it's, a, it's the biggest, is it one of the biggest events in Dumfries and Galloway? Um, and, you know, so we would be um, helping that event by providing another event space and ca more car parking. Um, I think the plans here, I won't repeat what other people have said, but I'm glad that members have highlighted the utter lack of anything sustainable. Um, Councillor McComb pointed out there's no gas mains here, and it's a great disappointment there's nothing um, about solar panels. Had we been su successful in purchasing the site for the community, uh, we were, by the way, given um, community right to buy by the Scottish Government, so the money was available at market rate. Um, but the response from 3B was to just utterly ignore us. They didn't even um, have the civility to reply to us at all, ever. And we've made re repeated attempts to engage them and ask them if they would sell the site. Um, I think or not just me, but I think what Wigton does need is affordable housing so young people can stay in the area and that older people can downsize. And we'd had started to look into housing units that were suitable to young working people or older people and that would use renewable energy. Um, but we would not have had uh, uh, this huge number of houses um, you know, that, that it's been an open space on the edge of Wigton. It's been part of the historic um, common, good common lands of Wigton. And really, from a, I, I know you can't do it on moral grounds. You've got to have a, a planning reason to turn it down. But on, 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 if, if, you're, if on the grounds of social conscience and what is right, that land should be returned to the community for the community good. It shouldn't be going to build executive style housing because if all of you represent wards in Dumfries and Galloway and you know perfectly well, if people have large amounts of, the, of available cash and they're moving from other parts you of Britain- You have 30 seconds to go. Okay, they can find houses. There's no shortage of those houses. What we lack in Dumfries and Galloway is affordable housing for us so our young people can stay here in the, and in the hope that there are jobs for them. And that's what we need so that rural communities don't just wither away. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Thank you very much for being so precise in your timing. Uh, okay. If you would like to just stay with us at the moment in case there's okay. any members uh, who wish to ask any questions. I don't see anybody in the room. No, the, okay. no questions. So thanks very much for your presentation, no Andrew. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much, Chairman. Thank you. The, uh, the next uh, presentation is from the agent, uh, Andrew Clark, Robert Potter and Partners. Uh, again, you've got five minutes. And uh, are you with us today? I take it. Yes, I am, Chair. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, again, you've got five minutes, and uh, I, I will let you know when you've got 30 seconds to go to bring your presentation to a close. Thank you. Just starting your own time. OK, thank you very much, Chair. Um, my name is Andrew Clark of Robert Potter and Partners Architects, uh, representing the applicant. 
I would like to commend the case officer report and note in particular that this site has been a long-standing and long-awaited allocated housing site, which the applicant looks forward to delivering at this time of much needed economic recovery. The site provides an excellent opportunity for well-located central housing with a range of tenures and sizes, along with a unique opportunity of formalising a new park to the site. The housing will front and survey this, uh, is, uh, give surveillance to this open space, which will be to the benefit of the wider community, whilst allowing functions that the former show field provided, and that will include also the book festival. The developer is a well-known local business. They are a large employer within the region. Uh, this development will play a significant part in the business's forward workload in 2022 and beyond. This development will benefit not only securing local employment, but also provide local housing to retain employees that the company have within the area. Uh, I would therefore request the members to proceed with the officer's recommendation. And just to mention a couple of more specific matters that have been raised, um, particularly Councillor Young. Uh, there are solar panels incorporated to the housing. Uh, there is no gas in Rigtown, and all of the houses are proposed as having air source heat pumps. Um, there is uh, a specific drawing on heat sources within the application, which indicates this. Um, the uh, application was made well in advance of the, the, the current and just ad adopted uh, supplementary guidance on sustainability, reducing carbon emissions in buildings. But uh, this application, as it stands, will comply with that uh, supplementary guidance without any changes. Um, a further point on Councillor Ferguson, uh, it, it is a private housing development that is proposed. Um, the, uh, the, the application does, however, require a section 75. There is affordable housing provision to the site. There has been uh, discussions with uh, the South of Scotland Community Housing and Lorburn in delivering affordable housing within the site, and that will be incorporated as part of the section 75. And that does provide a mechanism for uh, housing adaptations to uh, suit the needs of the housing demand of uh, uh, adaptions for disabled uh, use. Um, just further aspects on the more historic features. The the um, the, the the boundaries are uh, the boundaries with stone walls are noted as being uh, a, a particular value. Original stone boundary walling links, particularly along Southfield Lane, is recognised as integral to the historic fabric of Wigton. The stone walling throughout the remainder of the site is also seen as ha having a significant value. Th th those are all being retained as part of the development and being incorporated into the development proposals. Um, and even the, the brick wall um, to Lillico Lane gets removed and replaced with a, a new stone wall uh, and also retaining a stone wall along uh, that elevation as well. Um, the, uh, the, the open space... Um, it, it will become a, a it is is not a safeguarded open space it is an allocated housing site but this does provide a unique opportunity of providing a significant area of open space centrally to the development uh, which will be able to be used by the wider community it uh, it, it will be overlooked it will have dwellings fronting this to ensure a positive and attractive edge to the park to provide appropriate surveillance security and you it will have 30 prevent seconds backland. left thank you and it will prevent uh, backland or uncontrolled poorly used space um so uh, I, uh, just to finish off i'd be happy to answer any questions from members thank you thanks very much uh, yeah i was going to ask you just to stay there in case any members uh, wish to ask any questions I don't see any hands or speak in the chat. 
No. Well, thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, members, we're now in session. Councillor Ferguson. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. My technology is a bit slower. I'm not sure if it's the chair to the keyboard uh, transition that's the problem. Um, I, I'm, I'm heartened to hear that they're working with um, a responsible social landlord for uh, to make sure that they're going to cope with uh, that level of disability. So my concerns and that have I raised it early on are, are being taken care of, I would suggest. Um, I, I think it's just a, 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 a final contribution because Chris very, very um, uh, helpfully pointed out that it's under OP3. Currently, it's community facilities, which should include health facilities. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering if there's a learning in this uh, that we should be, um, uh, when we get a significant, like 10% in a local community, is a lot of houses. Um, uh, that we should be including uh, local GP surgeries and chemists, for example, um, just to make sure in the future. But I do appreciate that's the future. It's not this planning application. So Denny, um, Denny scalped me for that one, John. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy now that I've heard the explanation for the, um, uh, the representative of the applicant. Yeah, thanks very much, Councillor Ferguson. Uh, if there are no other members wishing to speak, the recommendation is to approve the application subject to A, the successful completion of the Section 75 planning obligations with six months of the date of the decision or the other reasonable extended time scale as agreed by the appointed officer and B, conditions. And David did uh, reiterate that Condition 6 would uh, form, have a form of words to add the stonework. I take it that's una unanimous. Uh, it's Councillor Thompson. Yeah, happy to support. I think um, it was just on the on the finishing details. For example, the colour of the the roofs. For example, um, maybe if that could, that detail could be clarified, um, you know, with officers as within the condition. Yeah, that's a fair point. Councillor Bentley did bring that one up, so uh, I think that would probably be acceptable by members. Yeah, Chair, can I come back in? Yes, yeah, certainly, Councillor Ferguson. Uh, right, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I think. And I'm wondering where I'll take David's advice on this. I, we've, we've got the agent telling us that they're going to be uh, working with a recognised social landlord for the um, affordable housing part of the development. Um, is there a form of words we can put into the conditions that actually make sure that happens? Because at this moment in time, we've, it's, I can't see it in the recommendations, uh, recommended decision anywhere. So is, is there a way we can make sure that that takes place? Thanks, uh, Andy. Uh, Chris, I wonder if you can help Councillor Ferguson on that point. I think David was... Uh, oh, David, OK. Uh, um, sorry, could I maybe ask, but just to clarify, on page 54, the recommendation is a requirement uh, that the development provides at least 20% of the proposed residential units at the site as affordable housing um, or adopting one of the accepted alternative methods set out in LDP2 policy H5 and associated supplementary guidance related to affordable housing provision. So that would be part of the Section 75 planning obligation which would be required to be entered into before we would ever be able to issue uh, an actual planning permission. So is that what Councillor Ferguson was looking for? Um, otherwise, maybe um, Laura could advise as to the content of Section 75s and whether or not it would actually specify anything such as uh, special um, adapted style housing. Thanks, David. That's been helpful. Andy? Um, I, can we hear what Laura's got to say first? I think David's kind of uh, handing it across the solicitor just to, uh, to give us chapter and verse. I am, but I'm, I'm comfortable with, uh, at this moment, I'm comfortable with what David's just said. But uh, let's see what the solicitor has to say. Thanks, Good Andy. Laura. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Um, ordinarily, when instructions come through from planning, that starts off a discussion between legal services and either directly with the developer or the developer's agent. 
as to what the content will be in the section 75 and it's not unusual to have it stipulated um, in that who's going to be supplying it whether it's an RSL or whether the developer themselves so that is something that the section 75 will um, cover. Does that help Andy? Uh, that, that covers it beautifully thanks very much Laura uh, and, and David for your advice thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I've got Councillor Young. John. Thanks, Chair, for letting me back in. Um, a bit of a similar concern to Councillor Ferguson. I was delighted, absolutely de delighted to hear the agent say the, the properties would all have air source heat pumps and would also have solar panels. Could we get that written into the conditions to make sure it actually happens? Uh, thanks, uh, Chris. I don't know if you can help with that, uh, or David. Yes, happy to uh, add an additional condition for the avoidance of doubt, if that would help members, just that uh, all houses had to have uh, air source heat pumps. Thanks very much. Is, does that satisfy you, John? Yes, thanks. And solar panels. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I've got uh, Councillor Drysdale. Pauline. Thanks very much, Chair. Could I just ask David Sutty if he's ab able to elaborate or if, as a group, we're in agreement that we could have a little bit more detail with how these houses can be transformed for the elderly. We're all aware of the costs when you have to put in lifts and cut through ceilings and stairs are not wide enough when developments are built nowadays. And with a huge ageing population and, of course, young people, but more for the ageing sector, how exactly will these houses be developed? We've seen it time and time again that it's been said, but it doesn't actually happen. So I don't know if that's you know something we could put in the conditions or not. So if David could just clarify that for us. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Pauline. But uh, we're dealing with the application in front of us. Uh, but I'll let David come in and see if he can help. David. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, you, you slightly beat me to that one. Um, it is what's before you. A building warrant obviously will be required. Building regulations require um, all properties these days to have a, a level of um, design and space such that you can actually get wheelchairs and accessibility around them. So any house which would be built would have to comply with the current building regulations. Um, beyond that, it is really that you have the application that's before you. It is um, a scheme of 43 houses by a private developer, but 20% would have to be affordable housing. Thanks very much, David. I've got uh, Councillor Carruthers and Councillor Martin, and after that, we'll try and tie this one up. So, Councillor Carruthers, please. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, just that condition that Councillor Young's asked to be put on, just like the imperative. Like David said, that's not a problem, but. To put in the context of my concerns on about that, whether it's that uh, the duct in regards to uh, uh, recharging, whether it's the solar panels, I mean, a photovoltaic is, is, uh, has a higher output than a solar panel. A ground source heat pump has a higher output than a, a, an air source heat pump, and they're very much uh, part of the building regs. So I just, I, I just, I would personally uh, test the competency of, of that particular condition being applied. Because ultimately, we could have, uh, we could be restricting uh, when it comes to renewable energy source uh, products that they can apply. So, why air source, not ground source? Why solar panels, not photovoltaics? Why not small uh, micro turbines? I just think we're getting the gold standards here, too, and I'd like to test the comments of that, please. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Carruthers. Uh, I don't know if Chris or David wants to come in on that particular point, David? Yes, and certainly, Chair. Um, all I was doing was really, because we have the agent having confirmed that all the houses have an air source heat pump proposed, um, all I'm literally doing is suggesting that we take him at his word and require that they be implemented. But again, you can always word conditions such that, or such other alternative um, renewable heating sources as may be appropriate. Uh, again, I think I, I didn't actually put forward about the solar panels or PV cells on the roof um, simply because that hadn't actually been mentioned. So it was just because uh, Andrew Clark had mentioned specifically about the air source heat pumps. It wasn't uh, unreasonable, in my view, to actually just condition that as a requirement. 
Thanks very much, David. That's been helpful. Uh, I think that would probably be the sensible way forward. Councillor Martin. Thanks, Chair. It's just on a point of clarity on the procedure here. As I say, when we had an objector up there and we was asked if he had any questions and there were no questions for the objector. And normally they can't, well, they shouldn't be able to come back in. Yet we've had an objector going on to chat and coming back in with the information after he's after he has spoken. What's the position regarding this? He shouldn't have been able to come back in with a comment. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I did see that in the chat, uh, <laughs> Councillor Martin, and I, I just ignored it. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, once we're in session, nobody can address the committee. But thanks for pointing that out. I don't know what the action would be, but Tracy, I don't know if you've got anything you could add to that. Yeah, Chair, I'll just, if members can just discard any comments that are being put into the chat from any previous speakers, thank you. So, uh, thanks very much. I think uh, we've kind, kind of come to a consensus on this application. Tracy, do you want to just uh, take us through that, please? Thanks, Chair. So, members are agreeing to approve the application subject to A, the successful completion of a Section 75 planning obligation within six months of the date of the decision or other such reasonable extended timescales agreed by the appointed officer and the conditions detailed in the report with the amendments to condition six regarding the wall and 13 regarding the, the roofing colour and an additional condition 20 for the air hope in the house having the heat pumps or such alternative heat sources. I'm not, I'm not including the solar panels in that one here. Are members content with that or do they wish to have the solar panels included? Councillor Thompson. Uh, thanks, Chair. I mean, it could be my faulty recollection, but I did think the agent mentioned solar panels when he was talking about it. So if, if we're taking him at his word on the air source heat pumps, we should take him at his word on that as well. That's my view. Thank you. Absolutely. That's why I thought what was being said as well. So. Okay, so an additional condition about the air horse heat pumps or alternative heat source and the solar panels. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, members, and uh, thanks, Chris, for your presentation. Members, we now move on to uh, agenda item six, which is erection of a dwelling house and formation of ve vehicular access and track at land west of Murrayfield, Rockcliffe. The planning application number is 21 stroke 0536 full the application is full application and approved subject to conditions. Uh, we have Judith, who's the case officer. Judith, if you'd like to take members through your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, this is the application at Land West of Murrayfield, Rockcliffe. Um, if you go into a location plan, the, the site is coloured red on this plan and is on the southern side of the C23S public road. The site forms part of an agricultural field and was within the East Stewartry Coast National Scenic Area and the Solway Coast Regional Scenic Area. Um, please, next slide. Yeah, this is the site plan. It, the, the site consists of two parts, the access to the public road, which is a long thin bit, and the part for the siting of the proposed, proposed dwelling house, which is the thicker bit at the bottom. The northern boundary where the junction would be is adjacent to the public road and the site slopes gradually down from the northeastern corner. Along the eastern boundary of the site are the properties of Murrayfield and the Flat and Screel. This is a proposed plat site plan which is very similar to the one before. Um, on this plan the proposed dwelling house is shaded grey. Um, the dwelling house would have an integral garage, two parking spaces and a turning area adjacent to the house. Plots one and two are also shown on this plan which correspond to the layout for an in, an in, the in-principle application which was granted in 2020, and this is referred to in paragraph 1.6 of the report. Next slide, please. This is the, these are proposed elevations. Um, the dwelling house would be part single storey, 
and part two story with a footprint approximately 175 square metres and a height to ridge of about 7.5 metres. The north and south are the long elevations to the left hand side and the east and west elevations are the short ones. The dwelling house would have a full ground floor full height glazing to the, the living room and kitchen areas and can be seen on the south and west elevations and there's a recessed first floor balcony to the main bedroom on the west elevation. Um, the finishes would be white render with stone feature panels to external walls and natural slate to the roof. Windows and doors would be aluminium clad coloured grey. Um, the proposal also includes an air source heat pump which will be located um, adjacent to the garage wall and 12 photovoltaic panels to the south facing um, roof slope. Sure. Moving on to the next slide, it's the proposed floor plans, ground floor and first floor plans. You can see the integral garage on the ground floor at the top of the first plan um, and the living room dining area at the bottom, which would be the single storey element. Moving on to the proposed sections. The top section 3-3 three, three is through the dwelling house the short way um, on north-south and has a ridge level of a neighbouring property scale marked on it, um, which would be slightly higher than the proposed dwelling house. This is discussed in paragraph 4.6 of the report. Section 2.2 and 1.1, the bottom two sections are long sections and they both show the proposed dwelling house relative to the neighbouring pro property scale, the nearest property scale. Um, next one, please, photographs. <clears throat> this is on the approach from the public roads going down the hill. Um, I mark the approximate location of the access. Um, the, I'm just standing in the in the access to the properties of Murrayfield and Screel to take the picture. Next one, please. This is standing on the road and looking into the site along the eastern boundary. The dwelling house is approximately in the middle of that image, in front of the brown reeds, the brown strip of reeds across the middle, um, and the access would run along this boundary on the left-hand side. Uh, next one, please. Thanks. This is the south look, view southeast from the public road over the site. This is taken further down the road, looking towards the boundary where the access would be, and the proposed dwelling would be in the right hand side of the image in front of the reeds. The dwelling house you can see on the edge of the photograph is Murray Field. Um, this is looking north along the route of the proposed access. So um, this would be standing at you know the gates to the, the two gates on at the, this point and this is looking back towards the public road which I've marked along along the access. Next one. This is similar to a previous one, uh, the view, view over the area of a site and dwelling house from the road. Next one. And this is uh, looking along the southern boundary up towards Screel, so the, the dwelling house would be in the middle of that of that view. And the final slide is just to give a flavour of other properties and buildings in the area. And to summarise, the application is for full planning permission for one of three plots which already have permission in principle. No objections have been raised by consultees and the proposal is considered acceptable on design grounds subject to conditions and the application is recommended for approval as detailed in the report subject to the conditions as listed. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Judith. Uh, members, any questions to the case officer? Uh, uh, I don't see any. If that's the case, we'll move on to the representers, uh, we have two statements uh, to be read out from objectors and the agent applicant is joining us by a team. So we'll go to the objectors and Tracy, could you read out the first one? You'll have three minutes. I'll not time you though. I'll try and time you. Uh, Brian Hogg, please, if you could read his uh, statement out. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. 
The proposed development of this land was first presented to the committee in January 2020 when it showed relatively modest single storey units of a scale and proportion that reflected that of the adjacent dwellings and of a design that was not dissimilar to them but with a modern touch. Those illustrations persuaded the committee on the day that the development of this land for housing was acceptable and it was therefore expected that the subsequent applications would be for dwellings along similar lines. However, the proposal before you today bears no resemblance to those earlier illustrations and promotes a design, form, scale and appearance of dwelling that bears no resemblance to those, nor indeed any of the single storey dwellings immediately adjacent to it and which establish the character and setting for this sensitive edge of a settlement location. We object to this proposal that is clearly not considered or respects the scale, form and massing of those properties immediately adjacent to it that establishes its context. The very modern and contemporary design proposed is also very much at odds with the planner, similar vernacular style of the architecture of the adjacent dwellings and also that dominates throughout the village and gives it its warm charm and character. The massing of the property and its close positioning and siting to adjacent properties will result in a very overbearing proposal, dominating the aspects from those neighbouring bungalows, much to the detriment of, those of their amenities and the owner's continued enjoyment of them. We are also concerned that as this is the first of three possible dwellings on this parcel of land, such an uncharacteristic style and design of the property will establish a precedent that will allow others to follow or attempt pastige and thereby individually or collectively compounding the incongruity of the scale and style of the proposal and its unsympathetic characteristical contemporary design. The application site occupies a very, very visible and prominent position on the edge of the village as you approach it from the A710 and will feature very conspicuously that the vista as you enter and leave the village. It is therefore important that the dwelling built there should respect and fit in with the traditional form and template that the other dwellings around it adhere to. It is submitted that the proposed development by virtue of its unsympathetic scale, massing and form together with its modern design that has paid no regard for the vernacular ar architectural traditions of the surrounding properties that inform the character and setting of the plot will create an incongruous and visual discord element at the sensitive edge of the village site to the detriment of the amenities and landscape setting of it and should therefore be regarded as being contrary to the established provisions of LDP2 policies OP1 and OP2. Thank you very much, Tracy. If you can go on to the second objector, John Napier, please. The detrimental physical impact and design issues have not been properly addressed. This is a two and a half storey development completely out of keeping with the village. The applicant has been very selective in its submission of the property comparison examples, arguing that there is no standard. However, by any standard, the application is completely unacceptable to Rockcliffe in terms of spatial impact and visual attractiveness. The committee has a duty to retain the village standards and not be influenced by precedent in terms of previous approvals, which might be hindsight be regarded as unacceptable. The argument on the village development plan takes primacy, does, does not remove responsibility to properly address the many justifiable objections. The issue on the roads has not been properly addressed. This entrance on the difficult downhill hill bend with no pavement used by cyclists, walkers, children walking to the beach and school buses. Car packs have been jammed this summer with overflow vehicles on roads, grass verges and yellow lines. The committee should be encouraged to look in more detail at the many important objections and not be over influenced by a development plan and some poor president development to protect one of the most scenically important locations in Dumfries and Galloway. Thanks very much, uh, Tracy. The uh, next representatives is the agent applicant, Alistair Rankin and Craig Richardson. Do we have you online? Yes, Chair, I'm here. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, again, you'll have three minutes and uh, between you and uh, with 30 seconds to go, I will ask you to bring your presentation to a close. And if you please remain with us in case any members from the committee wish to ask any questions. So in your own time, gentlemen.
Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll present um, and then Craig's available for uh, any questions as well at the end of that. So, uh, Chair, Councillors, thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. My name is Alistair Rankin. I'm the Managing Director of Aitken Turnbull Architects. Um, we've worked with the Planning Officer to bring forward proposals for a new dwelling house at Rockcliffe. The, in developing the proposals, we've been conscious of the need to respond to the specific setting of the property, both in maximising views and enjoyment for the house owner and in reducing impact on the surrounding properties and community. The principle of the residential development was established in the previously consented application for planning in principle, which was granted uh, at the 29th of January 2020 committee um, and then released following conclusion of the Section 69 agreement. It's worth noting that this is a recent application considered and granted by this committee who supported the recommendation of the case officer and that our proposals have been developed to ensure the conditions imposed on the earlier and principal application can all be met. Any new development creates impact on the existing context and we're aware of that. However, we have worked hard to minimise this and we believe that our approach to development is uh, appropriate and in keeping with the adjacent houses, Squeal, Murrayfield, uh, Taylor and to the wider context of Rockcliffe Village. No issues have been raised in respect of servicing the site, either by utility providers or in relation to road access and parking by the Council's road officer, either to this application or the previous and principal one. Uh, our proposals provide adequate parking and turning space within the site curtilage and suitable visibility displays at the site entrance. The existing site topography has been used to minimise the impact of the proposed house on the neighbouring properties. We've worked with the existing slope to allow the proposed ground floor level to sit lower to prevent the ridge height being taller than the adjacent property at Screel. Uh, the proposed house has been reorientated on the site from the indicative to pros proposals in the planning and principal submission. Uh, in that, we've located the proposals by 90 degrees to present the gable elevation to the eastern neighbour uh, to reduce the surface area and minimise the impact on their views, really sh sh shrinking the size of the, the property that faces them um, over the original one. Uh, and the design is, it is contemporary um, and reflective of its era, as the surrounding properties are of theirs. In the wider context of Rockcliffe Village, this allows the individual stages of the development of the village to be read and understood. Uh, however, the materials have been selected to complement the surrounding properties. White render, natural slate, natural stone. Um, then the proposed construction itself of timber frame is inherently well insulated. You have 30 um, seconds to go. Thank you. And we've incorporated an air source heat pump and solar panels to reduce the carbon footprint of the development. Finally, the house has been designed for someone returning home, someone returning to the area after moving south for work. And the very reason that people are protective of this area is the reason that they want to return. So, councillors, I hope you will again support the recommendation of the case officer and grant planning consent to this new home. Thank you. Thank you for being so precise. Uh, if you'd just like to stay there, any members got questions to the agent or the applicant? Don't see anybody coming in. Well, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Uh, Members, we're now in session. Could you use your microphone, please, uh, Councillor Sloan, if that's okay? Using my microphone, I agree the recommendation, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any alternative. Looks like a una unanimous decision. Tracy, just want you to remind the committee what the decision is. Yes, Chair. So members have agreed to approve the application subject to the conditions as detailed in the report. Thank you very much, members, and thank you, Judith, for your presentation. Now move on to agenda item seven. The formation of door opening to rear elevation of dwelling house at 16 Union Street, Kirkubri. The application number is 21 stroke 17930 full. The recommendation is to approve unconditionally. The case officer is Claire Kurt. Do we have you, Claire, with us? Have you joined us? Uh, no, Chair, I'm covering for Claire today, if that's okay. That's fine, David, yes. Uh, if you want to take uh, members through the, the presentation, please. Uh, thank you. Um, just as a, a quick precie at the outset, I think the, the important bit for members to note, I'm sure many of you will recall, is really set out on, in paragraph 1.4 on page 73, which gives the, the history. 
Uh, just to give you a, a quick summary of that, there was an application which went to the 20th of May committee with the decision issued on the 26th of May, um, which was to actually refuse the overall application there. There was a, an application which covered a number of things such as two new doors, new window openings and also uh, two dormers. Now, when members considered that, um, it did go to a vote, but it was actually refused. I should have probably made sure this was included in the report, but the grounds which were given for the refusal were the proposal is contrary to LDP2 policy OP1A general amenity in that the proposed rear elevation door opening onto the communal area would result in an undue significant loss of privacy and amenity and would be detrimental to the adjoining um, adjoining nearby residents. So that was the grounds that the committee chose to refuse that overall application back in May. Um, there was also at that time a listed building consent application for the entire development. There weren't enough objections to actually mean that that needed to come to committee. So that was approved subsequently under delegated powers. So the entire development has listed building consent, including the door that is proposed uh, before you today. There was subsequently another application for all the other alterations uh, for planning permission for that, minus the door. That was before you at the August committee and that was approved. So really, although the, the slides which I'm just about to run through will show the development in its entirety, all that you're actually considering today is that door on the rear elevation. So, Lara, if we just want to uh, we'll just go through the slides fairly quickly. Location plan, and um, the next one is just a slightly zoomed in location plan. Next one, block plan, and uh, just to show it in its context. It is obviously a listed building in the conservation area of Kukubri. Um, the existing elevations show you what that's like. Um, you will see on the top right hand side, that is the elevation where the, the door is proposed. So, and next slide just shows um, existing floor plans, roof plan. And the next one again just shows a, a section right through the overall property. And then the next one is really the, the, the number of what you're looking at. So again, it is the top right hand elevation there. It is the rear of the building and you've got a, a door that is proposed there. It's a, basically a timber door with a, what's called a, a vision panel in it. Um, moving on, the next ones are really just to show you what's uh, proposed there. Top left-hand side, you can probably just um, make out there that on the left-hand side of that, you've got the door where it is proposed on the, the bottom of that. That shows that the door would open into the property. So it's not, just for going to doubt, the door would not open out onto the communal green opens into the property. Uh, sections are shown in the next slide. Uh, there's not really anything of relevance to the current proposal there. The next slide shows the actual proposed door, which is in the, the top left-hand corner there. So you can see it's a, a fairly traditional door in terms of material and designs. And next ones, we'll move on to just some photos. So that's the rear elevation, and um, you can see where there's the, the raised area there of communal uh, land, and then the door would be, be can't say it, door would be proposed uh, where you've got the, the main white section on that. And next slide is really just to show context of the other windows, doors overlook the courtyard area. So that's the first one, the second one. Um, on shows that there's a, also a door coming out there into the communal area. Next slide again just shows that in a bit more detail. And that's really it for the presentation. So it's just to be clear with members that the only thing which you're now looking at is planning permission for the installation of that door. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, David. Members, any questions to the case officer? I don't see anyone in the chat. No, oh, uh, Councillor uh, Drysdale, thank you. Thanks very much, Chair. 
Could I just ask David to confirm, you said earlier it's, the listed building was approved, including the door. Is that what you're saying? Could you just reiterate that, reiterate that please, David? Thanks. David. Yes, Chair, that, that is indeed correct. The application for listed building consent didn't need to go to the planning uh, applications committee. So the, the actual issues which the members were concerned about is actually related to amenity, which is not what can be considered as part of a listed building consent application. All you can look at there is the effect on the character of the listed building. So given that that was not a reason which the planning applications committee had identified as being their concern, then that application was approved under delegated powers. So the doorway has listed building consent, but obviously can't be implemented unless and until planning permission is granted as well, which is why it's before you today. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks, Pauline. If there are no further questions to the case officer, we will move on to the representers. Uh, the first one is a statement to be read out. Uh, of Philip Alvey. So, Tracy, if you could read that out, please. First of all, I draw attention to the fact that the applicant's previous planning application 210412FUL was refused by a planning committee at their meeting of the 20th of May 2021, as the proposed door was deemed to represent an infringement on the privacy and amenity rights of the residents of Hearts Close. The precise reason given in the formal decision notice of the 26th of May was as follows. The proposal is contrary to LDP2 policy OP1A, general amenity, and that the proposed rear elevation door opening onto the community area would result in an undue significant loss of privacy and amenity and would be detrimental to the adjoining nearby residents. As nothing has materially changed since that meeting, my obvious first question is why is the above decision being ignored? The case officer's report makes two assertions. One, that it is not considered that the door's small glazed section would result in undue amount of overlooking or loss of privacy, as there is at least one other adjoining property that has multiple windows overlooking the communal area. I should point out that said property is owned by a fellow objector who has every right to look out onto her own garden. Two, that the proposed door would open inwards into the dwelling house and not outwards into the communal area and as such amenity is not considered to be an issue in this instance. Both of these statements are missing the point of this and multiple previous objections. A door is a door, glazed or otherwise, and regardless of whether it opens inward or outwards. A door's purpose is to allow access to and from the property. In this instance, access would involve trampling over our garden and invading the only private space the residents of Hatch Close have. Essentially, this already restricted space would become a through fair and incidentally just adjacent to where we sit our garden table and chairs. This absolutely constitutes a lack of privacy and amenity. A very brief site visit would instantly illustrate just how ludicrous this proposal is. Over the past several months, I, along with numerous other objectors, have patiently and painstakingly explained our concerns. With the greatest respect, I cannot understand why these perfectly legitimate objections from so many householders over such a long period of time have seemingly been ignored as evidenced in the report. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, our next representative is uh, Glenn Murray. Are you with us, Glenn? I am, Chair. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I have a an image that I was told could be shown while I was speaking. Could that be put up, please? Uh, I don't know. Have we got, we've, we've got uh, on our screen here, object the Glenn Murray. Uh, I think uh, the images are probably just, is That's that? That's it. Okay. That's it, Chair. Yes, thank you right. very much. Uh, just before we kick off, you've got three minutes. Uh, I'll ask you to bring your presentation to a close, uh, 30 seconds before your time is up. So in your own time, Glenn, just go ahead. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to address the committee on issues of considerable concern to me and to the neighbours on behalf of whom I'm speaking today. The proposed door has already caused a great deal of stress and anxiety. We thought it had been, uh, the issue had been settled in May, but unfortunately that appears not to have been the case. The application before the committee this morning is identical to part of application 210412FUL, which was refused by permission by the committee on the 20th of May 2021. Ironically, the very part of that former application, which was the basis for, on which it was refused. The minute of the committee meeting of 20th May states very explicitly the result 
in undue significant loss of privacy and amenity and would be detrimental to adjoining nearby residents. Absolutely has nothing has changed since that decision was minuted. There has never been a door in the rear wall of Union Street and the photo with the location of the proposed door drawn in, which you, you can see at the moment, shows very clearly that a door of any sort in the rear wall of 16 Union Street could not be used without the user walking through our sitting out and drying area and directly over our planted garden. This would clearly be in controversial of the local development plan's provision that protects the rights to amenity and privacy of neighbours. The community report's conclusion that, and I quote, the proposal is considered to be acceptable and compliant with the provisions of the local development plan is in direct contradiction of the planning applications committee, sorry, the planning application committee's decision on 20th of May. The arguments on which this conclusion is based, uh, I fear, represent the objections submitted by eight neighbours to this application. The reference to grounds B, C and D, the report on the current application says the proposed door opening to the rear of the property would not stop or obstruct in any way the residents of Hearts Close using the communal area. The door would open inwards into the dwelling house and not outwards onto the communal area. And as such, amenity is not considered to be an issue in this instance. The argument that because the door opens inwards, amenity is not considered an issue is irrelevant. Regardless of how the door opens, it could not be used without a huge negative impact on our right to enjoy the small garden drying and setting out area that we share. We're also very concerned that the report offers an opinion, not only inappropriate but inaccurate, that the proposal would not result in the overdevelopment of the plot with sufficient space remaining for garden ground. That's a quote. The plot referred to here is not the property of the applicant. Surely... Uh, you have 30 it, seconds uh, to go, Glenn. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Surely a view on how much of someone else's property that they may or may not use for gardening or any, any other purpose is inappropriate. We're, we're very disappointed and concerned that the report should contain inaccurate and inappropriate statements that deflect attention from our actual objections. The briefest comparison between our objections and the report would make this clear, and the briefest of visits to the site of the proposed door would show how it would contravene the privacy and amenity provisions of the local development plan. For these reasons, we Could respectfully you bring your presentation to a committee, close, please? I certainly can, sorry, Chair. We respectfully request that the committee upholds its decision of 20th May and refuses planning permission for this door. Thank you, committee and chair. Thanks very much, uh, Glenn. If you be so kind just to stay there in case any members have any questions. Yep. Members? I don't see anyone in the chat. Well, thanks very much for your presentation, Glenn. Our next, Thank you, our next objector is uh, Peggy Taylor. Are you with us, Peggy? Yes, I'm here, Chair. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. you will be given three minutes, and again, I'll uh, ask you to bring your presentation to a close uh, with 30 seconds to go, and in your own time. Thank you, Chair. I would like to try and convey to you the value of the, this privacy and amenity to which we refer in our objections to this proposed door. The right to the exclusive use of the area at the end of Hearts Close is specified in the title deeds of the Hearts Close and 12 Union Street properties. It is not a public space. 16 Union Street has no such right of use and has its own private garden and is one of three residential properties owned by the applicant in Kirkubri. The part of our garden that forms a boundary with the rear wall of 16 Union Street, where the door is being proposed, is set back and secluded from the rest of the close. During COVID lockdown, the area took on an even greater importance to us and to our mental health and well-being, as we were able to plant and grow vegetables, then share the produce. Due to the underlying health conditions, age and mobility issues of one of the residents, on whose behalf I am speaking, this area of the close has become particularly important as a private outside space where she can safely sit in peace and enjoy the garden. Case officer's report states that with the proposed door, there would still be, quote, sufficient space remaining for garden ground and would not materially reduce the privacy or amenity of adjacent properties and that the proposed door would not stop or obstruct in any way the residents of Hearts Close, close using the communal area, unquote. Both of these statements are categorically untrue. There is already only limited space on the perimeter of the drying room patio that can be used for growing. Any use of the proposed door would result in the loss of over 70% of our growing space. The garden and drying green is the only outside space that we have, and the proposed door would severely reduce an already limited amenity. 
There is nothing in LDP2 to substantiate that a private space owned and used in common by a few households should enjoy any less right to privacy and amenity than one pertaining to only one household. The door cannot be constructed or used without removal of our established vegetable beds or walking through our laundry and sitting out area, as the photographs show. There is no path to this door, only a narrow drain between the rear wall of 16 Union Street and the garden bed. As clearly stated in Local Development Plan 2 supplementary guidance, gardens can improve quality of life for residents and the council considers it important for a home to provide appropriate garden space, not just for current residents, but also future residents, and that any residential extension or alteration should not result in the unacceptable loss of external amenity space or compromise the quality and usability of any remaining amenity space and should not conflict with nearby yeah, land. You have 30 seconds to go. Thank you, Chair. Therefore, the proposed door clearly contravenes LDP2, OP1 and policy H8. For clarity, we are not asking the committee to decide on issues out with its remit, such as rights of access or civil matters. Listing building consent, although given, relates specifically to design and materials. Our objections are on the basis of the infringement of our privacy and amenity rights. We ask the committee to protect our amenity and quality of life and to uphold their previous decision to refuse. Thank you, Chair and members. Thank you very much. Spot on. Three minutes. Well done. Uh, if you'd be so kind just to stay with us in case any members got any questions. Yes, absolutely, Chair. I don't see anyone in the chat. Oh, Councillor Maitland. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, Chairman, I, I wonder if I could just ask um, the objector. She made a um, comment, um, and I just want to be absolutely clear about this. Um, you, you, su you suggested that number 16 already has a piece of private garden. Can you confirm that that's what you said? Yes, um, Councillor Maitland, I did. Um, where the, the image that you see at the moment, to the right of that, um, behind my property, which you can barely see that, that bit of yellow door, there is a private garden that belongs to 16 Union Street. That's separate and, 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 and set off. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Maitland. Uh, I don't see anybody else. So thank you very much, Peggy, for your presentation. The next one is the agent. Uh, we've got Edward Lipton uh, via Teams. Edward, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. I'm hoping you can see me and hear me. Yes, I can see you and hear you. Again, you will have three minutes and uh, I will ask you to bring your presentation to a close uh, 30 seconds before. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any time uh, Thank you, ahead. Chair. Sorry, thank you, Chair. My name is Ed Lipton. I'm the owner of 16 Union Street and have lived there with my wife and two kids for just over a year. Your officers have laid out policy clearly and concisely with a recommendation for unconditional approval, yet we are here for a third time due to objections rallied. Of the 25 properties notified, there have been eight objections, one from a tenant, one from an owner, two from owner occupiers, three that share an interest in two addresses on Hearts Close and one from Union Street. The last three properties described are connected in multiple ways and therefore there is an inevitable vested interest. They are the last properties at the end of Hearts Close. They back onto one another. The occupants are in a long-standing relationship. We have heard from both occupants of the committee today and unitedly they have commandeered common land that sits between them immediately behind number 16 with a vegetable patch, the exact location of the proposed door providing access and ingress for number 16. The vegetable patch is interfering legally and physically to the point of being preventative to the use of the common ground which is intended exclusively for access, egress and drying clothes. Number 12, 14 and 16 Union Street and Hearts Close all share equal rights to access and egress and are suffering as a result of the annexing of common ground. Although not a planning matter, I would like to make the legal position absolutely clear. Our solicitors have, have confirmed that there are three properties on Union Street that all share the same common rights in title of access and egress to High Street through Hearts Close. These are number 12, number 14 and number 16. I quote from my title document. 
subject 16 Union Street, tinted pink on the title plan, together with servitude rights of access and egress to the rear of the subjects in this title, over Hearts Close, leading from High Street to the rear of the said subjects. Number 12 and 14 have windows and a door that both overlook and access the drying green at Hearts Close. Number 16 has windows that overlook the drying green at Hearts Close and is the only property of the three that has been, de been denied its legal right to access and egress. There is also evidence of a historic door to the rear. The description of the drying green as is follows, the common ground used as a drying green. The objectors have continuously ignored this legal position that applies to 12, 14 and 16 Union Street. There is no ambiguity. The drying green is not privately or collectively own, owned, but shares rights in common for the, you express have 30 seconds to go. for the express purpose of access and egress for numbers 12, 14 and 16 and the drying of clothes. Your officers have put together another extremely comprehensive report with a recommendation for unconditional approval. Union Street is already has windows that overlook the drying green. Planning and listed building consent have already been granted for windows at first floor and at roof level, and listed building consent has already been granted for the door to the rear. I would urge you to grant planning consent in line with your officer's extensive and thorough report. My legal rights to access and egress... Could and you so bring your presentation to a close, please? and so as not to waste further time and expense for all concerned. For clarity, we have no interest in using the drying green for a garden or a drying green. We have interest in using the legal rights to come and go from the back of number 16 through Union Street. I'm Hearts sorry, uh, Edward, uh, you're thank actually you. over your three thank minutes, you. so you thank you very thank much. You. If you'd be so kind just to stay there in case any members uh, have yeah, any questions. It. Thank you. Any members got questions? To the representer, I don't see anybody in the speak. No, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Members, we are now in session. The recommendation is to approve unconditionally. Councillor Maitland. It's always difficult, Chairman, when um, you get legal problems uh, messing up physical planning, and um, and I, I am concentrating exclusively on the physical planning. Now, the um, the quarrel that is clearly um, amongst neighbours is is really not of great interest to me, and I think probably to you as well. Um, and we have to look at the physical side of this. And um, I thought that. The photograph was helpful in that it showed you the the door coming out of the back of the of number 16 um, where it would be um, I also feel that um, there is no question that you know this is a cherished area in the back in the back in the back of uh, number 16 um, but I heard nothing actually that changes my mind with respect to uh, reinforcing our earlier decision. This will have an effect upon the, the use of that property. Now, whether or not 16 has the right to it, it will still change the nature of, um, of that property. And so I still remain um, of the opinion, um, Chairman, that we were correct with the last um, um, decision that we made with respect to the door. You notice that members thought it was the door that was problematic. We have given permission um, for the windows um, and the access in the gable door to the private garden to the side that 16 enjoys. Um, and I think that is absolutely appropriate. So um, I, I, I think that we should refuse it on the grounds that we gave last time. I would like some legal advice as to if I use the word onto a communal area, because the last time the door was supposed to move and uh, swing out outwards. Um, this time it's not, um, as the report makes quite clear. So if I was to simply remove the word onto and put adjacent to, uh, would that cover um, um, the, uh, the fact that I'm not saying the door moves onto the communal area? Thank you, Chairman. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Maitland. Uh, I, I 
don't know who's going to come in on that, the legal side of it. Uh, David or Laura? Uh, I'll let Laura answer the legal things, but um, from from my understanding, and I can go back and check this, I don't think the, ro the drawing has changed at all. So the, the grounds that were given before is the elevation door opening onto. It, it is, it's, the access is opening onto that area. Um, it's not the fact the door wasn't swinging out onto uh, that area before. Uh, I'll double check that as uh, as Laura speaks, but um, my understanding is that it is exactly the same proposal as was before you and me. Thanks, David. That's helpful. Laura, do you want to add uh, to any of that? Alternative wording could be um, taking access from that the door allows access to be taken from an area. Yeah, thank you very much. Jane, does that help? It does indeed. Thank you very much indeed. In which case, then, um, the wording stands um, with the change um, that Laura has given us, taking access onto, taking access to. Thanks very much. Uh, I've got Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think, like Councillor Maitland, uh, I, when I looked at this and having heard what I've heard today, I think it's clear that there is an amenity existing and that there would be a loss to it, irrespective of any of the legal side of things, uh, which we're not here to debate, really. Um, and, and I would, sh if, if um, that's uh, Councillor Maitland's proposal, then I'm happy to second that again. My position has not changed. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, when I read the report, I mean, uh, especially 4.5, uh, when it says a degree of overlooking already exists, I think they were comparing uh, uh, doors with windows or apples with pears, uh, for want of a better analogy. Uh, I, I don't think the two are uh, similar, uh, in, in my view. Uh, so at the moment, we've got a uh, a proposal to refuse, seconded. Uh, Councillor Hislop. Chair, I would uh, like to move the officer's uh, recommendations. I think currently uh, there are doors opening onto it. If it is a communal area, then it will be for all properties, I would have thought. And if there is currently, according to the applicant, uh, servitude rights of access across there, he should be allowed to use his servitude right of access to that property. So I would move that we uh, accept the officer's recommendations. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Hislop. Yeah, 4.8, whether or not the applicant has the legal right to form a door opening in this location onto communal area is a civil matter. Uh, and I'm sure Councillor Maitland already reiterated that uh, she's not interested in the civil matter. It was more a loss of immunity, and I'm sure that's Councillor Thompson's view as well. So you're happy to go with the officer's recommendations. Councillor Sloan? Yeah, it just appears to me that some of the neighbours <coughs> are usurping this common land. With some of it, it's for number 16 as well. They have the common, the common access. So I, I just don't think there's enough in this to refuse. The, I don't think it would make significant difference to the neighbours. I'll, I'll, I'll move that the, uh, we agree the recommendation. Okay, thanks very much for that. Uh, I should have actually brought uh, Councillor Martin in. I just noticed he was before you on the speak. Uh, John, was that's, it on the same? No, that's fine, Chair. I've just got a second, Ivor. Okay, so we have uh, a proposal to refuse uh, from Councillor Maitland and seconded by Councillor Thompson. And we have... Uh, a proposal to uh, go with the officer's recommendations from Councillor Hislop, uh, seconded by Councillor Sloan. Tracy, do you want to just keep us right on that and we can go to the vote? Yes, thank you, Chair. So the motion proposed by Councillor Maitland, seconded by Councillor Thompson, is to refuse 
The application on the grounds that the proposal is contrary to LDP2 policy OP1A general amenity and that the proposed re-elevation door taking access onto the communal area would result in an undue significant loss of privacy and amenity and would be detrimental to the adjoining nearby residents. And the amendment proposed by Councillor Hislop, seconded by Councillor Sloan, is to approve the application unconditionally. Chairman. Motion. Councillor Blake. Amendment. Councillor Crothers. Amendment. Councillor Driver. Motion. Councillor Drysdale. Motion. Councillor Fairbairn. Amendment. Councillor Justy. Councillor Justy. He's left the meeting chair. Councillor Hislop. He's having connection. Thank you. Councillor Hislop. Amendment. Councillor Lever. Motion. Councillor Maitland. Motion. Councillor Martin. Amendment. Councillor Sloan. Amendment. And Councillor Thompson. Motion. We have six votes to the motion and six to the amendment. Chair, would you like to exercise your right to the casting vote? Motion. So the motion carries and the application has been refused. Thank you, members. We now move on to agenda item eight. This is the erection of a one meter high fence and removal of chimney stack. This is partially retrospective at Mill Park Cottage, Dalton, Lockerbie. The reference number is 21 stroke 1718 full, and the recommendation is to approve unconditionally. Uh, the case officer is going to be Chris Mateer, uh, standing in for Lindsay Little. Chris, are you with us? Yes, Chair, uh, I'm here. Uh, as, as you say, I'm uh, standing in for uh, Lindsay Little uh, today with uh, this one. Uh, just by a brief explanation, uh, my colleague Andrew Robinson and I have been uh, acting up as uh, temporary team leaders for the minor team um, for the last few weeks, and uh, that's, that's why I'm here. Um, the application uh, is here in front of members today, as there's been six or more uh, separate, individual and timelessly received uh, objections to the proposal. Uh, if we can move on to the first slide, please. <coughs> so the uh, site is located on uh, the western edge of Dalton Village to the north of the B725 public road. Next slide. Uh, Mill Park Cottage, uh, which you can see in the block plan here, is uh, a single storey detached dwelling with an attached double garage uh, constructed uh, round about 1989. Uh, if we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, the proposal, uh, which is partly retrospective, um, as, uh, as you, you can see from the report, uh, seeks planning permission for the removal of a chimney and the erection of a one metre high boundary fence to the front of the dwelling. Um, the chimney's actually been removed and the roof's been made good. Uh, the fence, uh, which has been started uh, but not completed, so you can see from the, uh, the plans there, the uh, existing elevation uh, at the top there shows the chimney and the proposed elevation underneath shows it removed and the detail of the fence uh, is shown underneath. Uh, the fence is comprised of uh, precast concrete blocks with uh, timber slatted infills. Uh, next slide, please. Again, this just shows the uh, the northwest uh, elevation, which uh, is is the rear of the the properties there. So you can see the the property originally had two chimneys, one on either end, uh, and it's the uh, the one to the gable that's been removed. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> So Lindsay's very kindly uh, added some photographs in so you can see the extent of the development here. So this is the view from the front, looking across the uh, the public road. And the next slide. 
This one shows uh, the property from further down the street. And the next slide. And that's a view of the property from the road junction to the east. Next slide. This just shows the gable end. Uh, you can see from the uh, the bottom photographs uh, where the uh, the chimney has been removed and the roof has been replaced and made good. Next slide. This just gives you a bit more detail on the front fence. And the next slide. I think that's the one more. Uh, so that just gives you an example of. Uh, the street scene in uh, Dalton Village, just uh, up from the junction. Next. So there's a historic uh, image from Google Street View, so you can see both the uh, both the chimneys on Millview Co Mill Park Cottage there. Next. OK, so um, the case officers carried out an assessment of uh, the proposal. Uh, the key consideration uh, is obviously the, uh, the impact on the conservation area. Um, the chimneys uh, which are included uh, on the house uh, were false. Uh, they were obviously included at the time to give a traditional appearance uh, to the uh, to the new dwelling as it was uh, proposed at the time. Um, over the years, there's been uh, an amount of water ingress uh, into uh, the chimneys. The chimneys were false uh, chimneys, so they had no uh, no function. Um, so. Information submitted by the applicant stated that the uh, the, the sort of the, there'd been water ingress into the timber frame from which the uh, the chimney was constructed, and uh, it rotted uh, through into the wood, which uh, necessitated its uh, its removal. Um, the fence uh, is a fairly standard design um, as far as fences go. Um, it's reasonably sympathetic to the scale of the dwelling. Um, Although noting that there are uh, not a great deal of uh, fences in the conservation area to the fronts of, uh, of dwellings there, uh, um, the case officer felt that uh, the fence wasn't sufficiently out of keeping with um, the, the conservation area as to warrant a refusal of the application. Uh, and so for the, the reasons set out in the report, uh, it's recommended that this application is approved unconditionally. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Chris. Uh, before I open it, to questions to the case officer, can I ask Councillor Young to switch off his video? <laughs> I think everybody can see the colour of your ceiling, John. Thank you very much. Okay, questions to the uh, case officer. Uh, who have I got first? I can see a hand up, but I can't see who it is. Uh, Councillor Carruthers, and then uh, Councillor Dryborough. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chairman. Just in regards to the defence in particular, I think in here, Chris, I take it permittable development rights are restricted because of the conservation area. Just a, a moot point, please. Chris. Um, yes, it's uh, it's something that Lindsay noted in uh, in her report. Um, anywhere else, um, it wouldn't require planning permission, but because it's in the conservation area, um, it does. So, yeah, a, a one metre high um, fence in general would um, would be permitted development um, unless it was within the cartilage of a listed building or in the conservation area. So that's um, that's that that's why it needs uh, consent, and that's uh, that's why it's in front of members today. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Carruthers. Uh, Councillor Dryborough and Councillor Maitland. Archie first. Yeah, um, thanks very much, Chair. Just a quick question with Chris. Obviously, Chris, you mentioned that there, was, there wasn't many um, walls or, or fences around any of the, the builders in the conservation area. Um, how large is the conservation area within Dalton itself? Is it the full village or is it just part of the village? And when you say there is, there's, there's only one or two with, with a fence round, and I think the only one with a fence round that I can remember was actually the village hall itself. Chris? Um, I'm not actually sure the extent of the, the conservation area within uh, Dalton. Um, perhaps uh, perhaps David might know um, that one, but off, off the top of my head, I don't know. Um, it's certainly something that Lindsay noted in her uh, report at uh, 4.5. 
Um, there was, uh, or there would have been at one point, a hedge that ran from the property to the west of um, of Mill Park, which would pretty much have run all the way down to the junction, um, a large part of which was, uh, was removed um, at the time that this dwelling was uh, constructed back in the in the late 1980s. So um, obviously a hedge um, doesn't require planning permission, but it is something that did um, front the, uh, the, the, the dwellings there. Um, like I say, you, you, you saw from the uh, from the photograph um, of the the, the the street scene um, sort of further around the corner from Mill Park Cottage. Um, there is a there is an absence of um, sort of front uh, fences or enclosures there. Um, but um, I'll I'll defer to your your local knowledge, knowledge councillor driver about um, the the town hall uh, or the the village hall there um for for that one but um, I'm, I'm i'm not sure of the full extent of the the conservation area there thanks chris i don't know if david wants to add anything to that david um i don't have the details in front of me but from memory of being area planning manager over there i think uh, um lara if you can actually go back to the first slide with the location plan that would probably help uh, it really is, it's to do with uh, the, the frontage that's along the, the B725 is the, the core part, but then it's extended and wraps around in, around the historic church uh, churchyard and then the houses on the other side of the road. So uh, I think we've got one more to go in with there. There we go. So yes, on the... The right hand side there that's the the core part of the conservation area but it does loop around where the application site is because of the the, the churchyard that's there thanks david does that help uh, archie um it does to a degree does it does that mean that the the houses which are you know uh, mill house there and, and the one that's actually in the application site are they out with the conservation area because if that was the case then they would not require building permit uh, planning permission no that they are specifically in the conservation area i think from memory it wraps around the field but i'd have to check that to be absolutely sure but I, i'm 99 percent certain that mill houses falls within it and certainly the application site does Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, I've got uh, Councillor Maitland. Apologies, uh, Jane. I just noticed that you were actually top of the list for speaking. It must be the slow connection coming through from the West. <laughs> Councillor Maitland. That's all right, Chairman. Don't you worry. Um, what I was going to ask actually follows neatly on from what Councillor Dryborough has point, point about the conservation area. And I suppose I'm really asking the, um, the officers, what's changed since 1989 when um, the conservation area was um, put in place and it was deemed Im important enough um, to insist that the design of this building um, had chimneys and clearly didn't have this sort of fence. So what has changed since 1989 when, when, when we decided that this was important enough to insist upon um, but now it's not. So I'd like to, like to be um, have some some explanation as to what the situation is. Thanks, Jane. Uh, Chris or David. In terms of uh, design, then, as clearly it would be preferable if um, the the chimney had still been retained. But it, it probably is worth stressing that this is a new house, as Chris says, from 1989 as opposed to a traditional um, building that was part of the, the old historic part of it, and certainly it's not a listed building. Um, other than that, it's, it's difficult to say what, what there is. It has been removed for the reasons of um, the, the rot that's come down with the water ingress that uh, Chris has explained. But um, beyond that, the, the policies since 1989, if anything, have probably got stronger. Jane? <clears throat> Excuse me, Jane? Um, well, I, I would just sort of uh, reiterate that that um, 
in my view, that this is a kind of slow and incremental grinding away of detail that was considered at the time. And uh, as the officer has explained, um, actually, we've got slightly tougher. But um, thank you. The question at this point has been answered. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor Mayland. Uh, I see uh, Laura would like to come in and give us some legal advice, I think. Thank you, Chair. Not so much legal advice as um, while people have been speaking, I've found the technical paper for the LDP2, which clearly shows the outline of the conservation area. If it was helpful, I could share my screen and that should hopefully come up for you all. If you can do that, Laura, that'd be great. I will attempt to be very technical. Hopefully you can see this. Yes, thanks very much. Thank you, Laura. That clarifies a lot. Cheers. Yeah, I think that's been very helpful uh, for members. Thanks very much, Laura. You're welcome. If there are no other questions to the case, officer, uh, we'll move on to representers. Uh, the first, uh, well, all statements, actually. There's four statements. Uh, the first statement is Paul Grosgrove, Cosgrove. Uh, Tracy, could you please read out Paul's statement? Thanks, Chair. I would like to state from the beginning that my objection is not based on subjective view with regards to me liking or disliking the particular fence. My objection is primarily based on the constraints of this application and the appropriateness of design choices made within this context. Firstly, my objection is not only that the style of the fence is out of character with the traditional style of the Dalton Conservation Area, the fence is the only fence of this type within the conservation village of Dalton. It's also the only physical boundary in the village that is placed directly against the tarmac of the road. There are alternative design choices that could work sympathetically within the constraints of conservation that are not being applied here. For example, the boundary could be small managed hedge like many other properties have, or railings echoing the style of the listed church boundary opposite. With regards to the East Chimney, the original permission for Mill Park was granted by this committee in 1989. The only constraint noted was that the conservation status of the village at that time. The chimney was false and included in the design to fit within the constraints at this time. It helped to settle the contemporary building into the conservation streetscape of the village. It should be noted that there are no other properties that do not have chimneys at their gable and none have, that have been removed. The chimney has been removed because of a leak. There are again alternative choices that could be made here that would remedy the leak and reinstate a false chimney. Not adhering to the constraints of the conservation statutes it's again is, not, un, is only unnecessary, but moves towards undermining the statutes put there to protect the conservation character and sets future precedent. To approve both these retrospective applications would set a worrying precedent with regard to the considered status of conservation. The recent March 2021 20, Dumfries and Galloway Local Development Plan 2 Conservation Area Review document states that the conservation status of the village remains appropriate and that care to retain the character of the remaining buildings and space and the layout will be required in the future. This is that time. I ask the committee not to approve the retrospective application and ask instead that alternative design choices are, are developed to take cognizance of the valued conservation status of the village as clearly outlined, evaluated and justified in the above referenced policy document. Finally, I would like to thank the committee for the time to consider my comments. Thanks, Tracy. The uh, second statement is Dr. Fiona Dean. Can you please read that out, Tracy? Thank you for the opportunity to add further comment to this important discussion. In terms of conservation value and status, Dumfries and Galloway's Local Development Plan 2 Conservation Area Review March 2021 offers a conservation grading status in which Dalton receives a score noted as being of clear special architectural or historical interest. 
Its strong character as a very small settlement is also stated clearly and it is noted that care to retain the character of buildings and spaces will be required into the future. The small scale of the village makes changes such as those proposed much more significant, visually amplified and pronounced. Prior to the removal of the chimney and addition of the more modern boundary fencing, Mill Park Cottage as a newer building settled architecturally and environmentally into the small village context through its modelling on the predominantly low level two chimney features of all of Dalton's houses. Its boundary too reflected the special features seen throughout the village being set back from the roadside and soft boundary to its edges. The addition of the modern timber and fence and hard to the roadside concrete kerb has no contextual reference anywhere in the village. These materials in themselves are more urban in nature and while timber is noted in the committee report as appropriate for use in the conservation area, the special character of Dalton is the point we are reference here and there is not one example of timber boundary fence, modern or otherwise, anywhere in the village. This addition is not insignificant. From the report, the modern timber fence is a substantial 90 metre in length, 12 metre of it on the frontage. Its difference is highly visible around the already newer building. If a closed boundary is necessary, it could be set back behind soft landscaping or made reference to external material, materials, such as the cast iron fence or stone wall of the B-listed church directly opposite Mill Park Cottage. The removal of the second chimney again has no contextual reference in any other part of the village. This is the one building in the conservation village with only one chimney to its gable. Water ingress is easily resolved through maintenance and repair, not removal. To reinstate a chimney is an immense doable task. The key point in both cases is that the, the opinions that would have there are options that would have been less detrimental impact on the conservation character of the village and that would have not been and not to be difficult to achieve. In summary, I would ask the committee to recommend that the chimney be reinstated and that the other boundary options more appropriate to the many references within the village are advised for the frontage. Not to do this sets a precedent for change throughout the village that could seriously undermine both its conservation character and status and the value placed on it by the conservation area review and the noted need for care into the future. Thank you for your attention and consideration. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, the next one is Robert and Barbara Parisi. I think that's how you pronounce the names. If you can read out their statement, thank you. We think that plan permission should have been sought before he decided to remove the chimney and erect a ranch style fence, which is totally out of place in Dalton. It also seems to have caused an optical illusion that makes the cottage seem closer to the road. We presume it has something to do with such a large ranch style fence being erected in front of Mill Park Cottage. They have also taken a large section of perfectly good hedgerow, which has been there for a very, very long time, and burnt it. So they obviously had no intention of putting it back. They obviously have no respect for the environment or Dalton as a conservation village. We wondered if a specialist had been brought in to check the chimney stack and if so, had he condemned it? The chimneys were dummy ones instead, insisted by planning to be erected as part of the original build. The chimney taken down was not even 40 years old. We have chimneys in Dalton from 100 years to nearly 300 years old. And if there are any problems, then we get builders in to put them right. We do not condemn them because they are being a problem. Thank you for taking our concerns into consideration. And the last one is Annie Thompson, Tracy. This statement makes particular reference to the planning applications report submitted by the case officer, Lindsay Little, and uses the paragraph numbers as a guide. The report was submitted after the public consultation ended, meaning that those with concerns not previously aired have, not had, have had no opportunity to comment. Paragraph 3.2 states that a, the style of fence is out of character with the traditional style of the Dalton Conservation Area, and b, removal of chimney is not in keeping with the conservation character of the village. These are both key reasons for not granting planning permission for both erection of the fence and the removal of the chimney. Paragraph 4.3 states that key consideration and assessment is whether the fence and chimney respects the appearance, character and setting of the Dalton Conservation Area. My view is that neither the erection of the fence or the removal of the chimney shows any respect for the appearance, character or setting. Quite the opposite. My reasons are outlined below. 
Paragraph 4.4 states that the chimney was originally false. Most of the chimneys in the village are, these days, non-functional and as such require regular maintenance and repair to prevent any ingress of water, particularly achieved by capping non-functioning chimneys. If we all decided to remove our chimneys, then it would negatively change the appearance and character of this conservation area. Paragraph 4.5. Before the boundary fence was erected, the front garden was tastefully planted with well-maintained shrubs surrounded by gravel. The greenery successfully softened the effect of the break in the hedge. I quote from the report, there are no other such fences of this nature within the immediate vicinity. All the buildings in Dalton, bar two, either open directly onto the road or have a dike or hedge for a boundary. There are no wooden fences at the front of any building in the village. Two very old buildings, the old school and currently used church, have black painted metal fences. The church is across the road from Mill Park Cottage. In conclusion, the chimney should be reinstated and be, if a solid boundary is deemed necessary, then should be either a hedge or shrub or at the very least be a metal fence which mirrors that of the church, both in design and colour. Thank you very much, uh, Tracy, for reading those statements. Members, we're now in session. The recommendation is to approve unconditionally. Councillor Driver. <coughs> Thanks very much, Chair. And I think you know the, the report uh, is quite clear in, in four point three that the key consideration in the assessment is this application where the proposal respects the appearance, character and the setting of the Dalton conserv area, the conservation area in which the site is located. As, as has been heard, there is um, no other um, fences like this and, 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 and a, you know, a, a, a chimney was taken down without planning, uh, planning um, advice. So the situation here is that, that, that this is a conservation area and, and obviously the consideration in the assessment is whether the proposal respects the appearance. My consideration is that it doesn't respect the appearance of Dalton Conservation Area and therefore we should reject this application uh, on the grounds that it, it, it's, it doesn't fit with the character and setting of the Dalton Conservation Area in which the site is located. I'm happy to move that, Chair. Thanks very much, Archie. I've got uh, Ian Carruthers and uh, Jane Maitland. So, Ian, first, please. Thanks, Chair. I suppose I take a different view to Archie in this one. I've been doing for a long time, my whole life, actually. In fact, I used to deliver coal as a coal boy, some of the houses with the chimneys uh, a long, long time ago. Yeah, Chair. So, you have, there's been very, very little development over the years when it comes to Dalton. Yeah, for large years, it stagnated and stayed, stayed as it has been. And it's whether the, the, what's being asked for here, and I've considered this because I've had both local constituents subjecting right to me as well as the applicant uh, being in touch as well, uh, making contact just in regards to why they felt it's appropriate that they've done what they've done. And so on balance, taking everybody's views into consideration, I would agree with the, with the, the report itself. This has been built in 1989. There's, I don't know what the closest age of building is to that. I go back probably 100, 150 years old has been outlined previously, Chair. So I, I would certainly agree with the recommendations. Is this, I think, what the, the style of fence that's there, it's befitting of the age of uh, the house that's there. And I understand it's for security reasons, in particular on about children. And the chimney, if both chimneys had been removed, I would have been against it, but there's only one. So again, it reflects the time and style of the house when it was built back in 1989. So I would move the recommendations, Chair. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Carruthers. So we've got a proposal to refuse and a proposal to approve. Uh, Jane, you'd like to come in? Yes, um, th thank you very much indeed. Um, well, I I'm minded to second Councillor Driver's um, views on this. And, and I can say hand on heart that I've had absolutely no approaches from anybody. I'm looking at this from purely from a completely... Um, dispassionate view from a way over in um, in the West. And and I just think these things are so important to try and and maintain because as you as you incrementally reduce and grind away, you change things. And 
you know, I've, I've looked again at the at the photographs, um, and there is no question about it that um, what has been done to the boundary treatment um, of this cottage and the removal of the chimneys, which does actually, whatever anybody says, really substantially change the roof line. Um, I think there are, uh, you know, enough detail here which has been changed um, that it actually does, I think, um, um, not respect the Dalton Conservation Area. So I imagine that's in HE2 um, that we would um, have some justification for this. So are you uh, seconding uh, Councillor Driver? I am. Thank you, Jane. Uh, so we've got a proposal and seconder to refuse the application. We've got a proposal to go with the uh, recommendation. Do you have a seconder, Councillor Carruthers? I'll second that, uh, Chair. Who was that? Uh, was that Dougie? It was uh, Duke Fairburn, yep. Thank, thanks, Councillor Fairburn. Uh, okay, so... I'll leave it up to you, Tracy, and we'll go to the vote. Thanks, Chair. So, a motion proposed by Councillor Driver, seconded by Councillor Maitland. Sorry, Chair, I think um, we've got speakers wanting to come in. Are you wanting to take them before I proceed with the vote? Uh, yeah, I've just seen that on my screen. Uh, I've got uh, Councillor Hislop and uh, David Sutty. So, uh, Councillor Hislop first. Chair, I was just going to second Councillor Crothers. OK, thanks very much. Uh, uh, David, you want to come in? Thank you, Chair. I was really just trying to um, distill down what Councillor Driver and uh, Councillor Maitland have said as a, a motion. Um, I would agree that if you're minded to go for a refusal, then the one to hang it on, as, as Councillor Maitland just said, is policy HE2 on conservation areas. So you're probably looking for it to be along the lines that uh, the proposals do not preserve or enhance the character and appearance of the conservation, the Dalton Conservation Area. Uh, the other query I was going to put to you is, obviously, this is a, a retrospective application, so the works have been undertaken. Um, it is obviously open to the committee to just simply refuse it and leave it at that. But... Um, the query is, do you wish to proceed with that as refuse and enforce? Thanks, uh, David. Uh, uh, I'll ask the uh, mover of uh, the motion, Archie. Yes, I, <coughs> thanks very much. And thanks for that, David. Um, and certainly we'll work under AG, AG2, um, the policy in, in, in which you said. I think um, from, from my uh, perspective, and I hope Jim would support this, that it would be um, remove and, 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 and enforce uh, the reinstatement of the chimney as well. Thanks, Archie. Yep. Councillor Mayland. Yes, Ch Chairman, I, I'm totally in agreement with that. And uh, even if it means that we'd, we'd have to carry out enforcement orders? Of course. It follows naturally from what we do. Yeah. OK. Um, Happy with those. Uh, Tracy, we'll go to the vote. So, a motion proposed by Councillor Driver, a second by Councillor Maitland, and that is to refuse on the grounds that the proposal is contrary to LDB policy HE2, as it does not respect the appearance, character, and setting of the Dalton Conservation Area in which the site is located, and proceed with the enforcement. And the amendment is proposed by Councillor Crothers, seconded by Councillor Fairbairn, to approve the application unconditionally. Chairman? Amendment. Councillor Blake? Councillor Blake? We'll come back to Councillor Blake. Councillor Crothers? Amendment. Councillor Driver. Motion. Councillor Drysdale. Motion. Councillor Fairbairn. Amendment. Councillor Justy. 
It's not come in. Councillor Hislop. Amendment. Councillor Lever. Motion. Councillor Maitland. Motion. Councillor Martin. Motion. Councillor Sloan. Eh, sorry, Councillor Thompson. Amendment. Councillor Young. Motion. And can I try Councillor Blake again? He's got amendment in the Uh, Chair, we've got six votes for the motion and six for the amendment. Would you like to use your casting vote? Yes, uh, amendment. Amendment. Thank you, Chair. The amendment has been carried and the application has been approved unconditionally. Thanks very much, members. We now move on to agenda item nine. This is uh, the erection of a wind monitor mast up to 90 metres above ground level with guys, bird diverters and mast mounted instrumentation for the temporary period of five years at Eukenhead, Polskioch South, 15.5 kilometres southeast of New Cumnock. The application is full application reference number 20 stroke 1990 full. The recommendation is to approve subject to conditions. And the case officer is Chris Matia. Welcome again, Chris. Uh, would you like to take everybody through your presentation, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I'm back in front of you with uh, my usual hat on uh, this time. So the uh, application is in front of members today um, as a statutory consultee. In this case, uh, Tinwin Community Council uh, have objected uh, to the proposal and officers are recommending approval. Uh, can we have the first slide, please? OK, so the application site uh, extends to uh, approximately 0.14 hectares. Uh, it's located uh, 12 kilometres southwest of Sankar and 13 kilometres northwest of uh, Tinrin, and it's located in an area of uh, commercial forestry. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this one just uh, is a... Uh, is a, a, a view of the, the, the wider area, which you couldn't really uh, sort of tell from the uh, from the location plan. Um, that was the uh, the first slide there. So the uh, proposal, uh, as we've mentioned, is for the erection of an anemometry mast uh, for a temporary period of five years. Uh, the mast is a slimline monopole design, uh, if we can see from the next slide. Uh, it's up to 90 metres high and is supported by anchor wires, uh, very much typical of a development of this type. Uh, next slide, please. This one just gives um, a, an overview of the mast uh, as seen from above and the extent of the directional guidelines uh, required to support it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this one is uh, a block plan showing it in the forestry and in relation to uh, the forestry track as it runs past it. Next slide, please. Uh, the proposed access taken from the north and the south uh, via either a combination of uh, existing public roads and existing uh, forestry path or forestry, a network of forestry paths uh, within the, uh, the commercial forestry area there. The next slide. Yeah, it should be us. Uh, so an assessment of uh, the proposal concludes that the, uh, the mass located in a relatively rural uh, and unpopulated area, uh, not readily visible from uh, the wider area as such, uh, it wouldn't have an adverse impact on the wider landscape. Um, should members be minded to, uh, to approve it today, recommended conditions uh, have been uh, attached uh, requiring low level infrared lighting, um, which is required by the Ministry of Defence, uh, typical for uh, a development of this type, and also the installation of bird deflectors um, on the, uh, the guy wires as well. Uh, and so for the reasons outlined in the report, it's recommended that this application is approved. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, any members got questions to the case officer? 
I see Jane's put in uh, looking for lunch. My stomach isn't rumbling, Jane. <laughs> I don't see anybody coming in for questions. And as this is uh, registered, there's no registered speaker for this item. Members, we're now in session. Good evening. I, I see uh, Councillor Maitland's come in and speak. Well, thank you, Chairman. No, <clears throat> what I wanted to be absolutely certain about is the lighting issue, um, because there have been problems in the past about whether or not the re it really was not going to be um, uh, obtrusive. Can, can you possibly go back on to what you were saying? I'm, I'm sorry, Chairman. I, I tried to get this in, but it wouldn't go quickly uh, before you went into session. Thanks, Jane. Uh, Chris? Um, yes, uh, so the, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the grounds of, uh, of the uh, Community Council's objection was, uh, was to do with, um, with the required aviation lighting. Um, I, I think there's been um, a, little, um, a little bit of uh, well, possibly confusion with uh, this one. There is, a, there is a, a Section 36 consultation in for um, a wind farm in the area uh, of which uh, this, um, this 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 met mast um, kind of forms part of. Um, so obviously, any any of those turbines would require um, sort of what you might call proper aviation lighting um, as required under the, uh, the the standing air navigation order. So anything above 150 metres requires a, a level of medium intensity lighting. Obviously, this mast uh, is only 90 metres high. Um, but it still does require some form of low-level lighting, um, which um, is a requirement from the uh, the Ministry of Defence. Uh, in this case, they have uh, they have indicated that um, they'll put in infrared lighting, which um, is, um, is 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 considered suitable lighting. Um, it is located in the transition area of the uh, the Dark Sky Park, but um, the supplementary guidance that we have in support of this and it is towards the outer edge of the, the transition it's not going to impact on uh, on the actual dark sky park itself um, whether any future wind development um, in that area would is, is is entirely another matter we're looking at the uh, at the mast itself um, but the uh, the supplementary guidance that we have in support of um, the the dark sky park um, supports lighting of this um, this type so I, I hope that answers your question, Councillor Maitland. Jane. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah, I see you've put thanks for the clarification. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Thanks, Chair. It was just to um, uh, support the application, I think, following the back of uh, Councillor Driver. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I don't see anybody with an alternative. Looks like a unanimous decision by the committee. Thanks very much, members. We now move on to item 10. This is a formation of access at 16 Fingland Court, Moffat. It's a full application, reference number 21 stroke 1618 full. The recommendation is to approve subject to conditions and the case officer is Beth Halliday. Are you with us, Beth? I am, yes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Beth. Just take us through your presentation, please. Thank you. I'll go through the presentation. The first slide, please. 16 Fingland Court is the end of terrace um, of houses uh, looking onto the home in Moffat. The home is the A708, the Moffat to Selkirk Road. Next slide, please. This is showing the, the end of the terrace, um, the distinct street scene of Fingland Court looking onto the home. The next slide, please. And again, the block plan showing the front garden and the, the dwelling house. Next slide, please. So this is number 16, and you can see where the, the A708, obviously, and then there's a cycle route and the footpath. Next slide, please. And again, this is just showing the distinct street scene of Fingland Court from the, the front, looking onto the home. 
Next slide, please. And this is showing the pend where access is to the back at Finglan Court, where the communal parking area is. And again, that shows the, the front area. Next slide, please. And this is looking towards Moffat, showing that there's a grassed strip between the cycle path and the footpath and then the road. Next slide, please. And again, this is looking towards Moffat High Street, showing the grassed area um, to the side, a communal grassed area to the, to the front. Next slide, please. And this is looking east towards uh, Jeff Brown Drive and the entrance into the school. Next slide, please. And this is showing the pedestrian and cycle signage. And you can see obviously the gable end of number 16 and the start of the, the grass area that separates the cycle path and the footpath next to the, 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 the sign, the line, the light sign, sorry. Next sign, please. And the last slide is the communal parking area to the rear showing where cars for um, Finland Court Park at present. Thank you. Um, the application is recommended for approval subject to conditions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Beth. Uh, any members' questions for the case officer, Stephen? Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I think in the report it suggests that um, the other houses along the, the row uh, wouldn't have a front door, um, but in fact it's the, it would be the case that there's a number of uh, houses along there that face uh, looking towards where the school would be that do have a front door. It's just that they happen at this moment to be enclosed by fenced off gardens, for example. Um, so I, su I suppose what I'm asking is, it, w would that be taken into account when you've come to your conclusions here? I've got another follow-up question, which is to do with the the, uh, the statement as well about the number of cars that a person has having a bearing on um, the outcome of a planning application. It, it seems to me to be irrelevant how many cars a person has <laughs> in terms of a planning consideration, but um, given that it goes along a cycle route, but um, I was just sort of wondering about the houses that front on to the home. Um, because there are a few of them, it's just that they currently happen to have a fence around them. Yeah, yes, thank you. Yes, um, what I was really pointing out there was that number 16, which is obviously at the end of the terrace, they don't have that grass strip. It, it starts at the, at the post, which then is at the opposite side of the pend, where number 17 is. But actually, um, much as, you know, that, that is there, and, and that is, is what is on site. I'm taking this on its own merits, um, and I, I think I mentioned that in the report as well, that um, nevertheless, I'm just pointing out that that is, that is the case, that it just, their front garden area goes on to the cycle path and the footpath and then onto the road. But if some of them, as you, as you say, are fenced off or, or have the grassed area, but they would be taken on their own merits too. Thanks, Beth. Uh, would it be possible just to have the, the photograph put up so that members can see that? That's that's quite a good one there. Just so that just shows where the the, the, the lamp post is. You can see is is really near the start of the grass area. I, I, I thought there was a, a couple of photographs back that had a better angle from looking away from Moffat. Yeah, that one there, I think that, that gives a, a better look because there's a strip of uh, green grass just from that lamppost onwards. And what you're saying is it's the house that's at the end of the terrace here, is that correct? It is, yes. The, the one in, that we're, we're looking at today is, is the end terrace, yes. Does that help, uh, Councillor Thompson? Yes, no, that's helpful. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Uh, is there anybody else coming in? Uh, Councillor Maitland. So, how, have I got this absolutely right? We are going to arrange something where you cross a cycleway and a pedestrian way and the, the person involved can simply reverse out onto a, onto a road like that. Beth? Yes. 
blimey, right? Okay. Uh, Councillor Hislop. Chair, it was similar to Councillor Maitland's point. Uh, I can relay, uh, recollect times when we looked at uh, putting that accesses into uh, houses that front on the main streets, whereby one of the conditions we usually asked was that they were able to turn so that they didn't actually drive. They had to drive in, turn, and then drive out. They weren't uh, reversing out onto the road. Has that sort of request been changed, or has the law changed that you know that it can be acceptable now to reverse onto a main road? Beth. As far as I'm aware, nothing has changed. No. I wonder if uh, David could maybe come in and help out. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, basically, if you're looking at a new development, that's a, a standard requirement that you, you should be able to get in and out in forward gear. Obviously, what we're talking about here is an existing one, and Beth has undertaken the consultations with the roads officers who've looked at it, and on its own merits, it's considered acceptable. I've put a little slide up there from Google Street View, which I think shows that whilst we would have to consider any other application on their own merits, in my mind, I don't think there are any other properties which are the same as this one, which would equally be acceptable, because you're going to be losing an area of open space, that grass strip going across it, and certainly the last four houses, when you get to the, um, the traffic control junction, they actually have a barrier in front of them, so they physically couldn't cross that. So on its own merits, this individual one, I think, is acceptable, given the comments of uh, the, the roads officers. Um, in terms of Councillor Thompson's other query about the justification for it, we're not necessarily accepting that that is the what has been put forward by the the applicant as their desired need for it but um certainly it's been looked at on its its own merits and planning terms and in terms of road safety which is quite clear in the report that's the key issue is road safety thanks very much david that's been quite helpful uh we query here uh, uh, there's mention about a 20 mile speed restriction area of moffat is that that main road as well does that come under the 20 mile zone Yes, it does at the time of, of of the school, as far as I'm aware, yes. Yeah, that's been very helpful. Thanks very much. So, I mean, the recommendation is to approve subject to conditions. Stephen? I, I have to say, Chair, that I'm quite uncomfortable about this simply because, um, because of the, the cycle path and the active travel routes and the proximity to the school and the fact that in... Um, the report, uh, it does talk about the informal uh, chat with the roads officer um, saying that the only p points of conflict would actually be when the schools uh, pick up, drop off times, etc., which is exactly the time when you don't want to have a conflict um, because of the, you know, families basically going about using the, the active travel or the roads thereby. So I, I, while there is a road safety issue acknowledged at that time informally, um, I think there is something else about what what this what what this sets out from us as a council. So, um, and I, I know we've sort of had difficulty sort of bringing in things to do with the uh, environment and active travel and, and climate and all the rest of it, which we had a long discussion about when we looked at the application about overhead power lines some time ago in terms of the council response in line with its new priorities. That's maybe a bit overkill here, but. Um, but I think the point remains similar in that um, we, we should really take into account how important active travel routes are and what this does to the integrity of that particular path and cycleway. Uh, I could also say that at the other end of the town, from the Betic end, there's a proposal to develop an active travel route there. And one of the problems with it is there are existing driveways across the footpath that go into the road. So I, I'm sort of trying to make sense of this holistically in terms of the Moffat context, but I'm sure there'll be other examples where we're struggling to get an active travel route in place because of driveways that cross the footpath. So um, I'm very uncomfortable with, it, with this. Uh, I'm not sure if we're in session yet, but I'll, I'll listen to what other members have to say. Are we in session? I think we were. All right, so it's all questions to the case officer. Thanks, Tracy. 
Uh, yeah, well, uh, we'll look at that when we go into session, then Councillor Thompson. Uh, I see uh, Councillor Maitland wishes to come back in. No, no, uh, uh, only when we're in session, Chairman. Sorry. Thanks very much. Uh, well, in that case, if there's no more questions to the case officer, we're now in session. Councillor Thompson, do you wish to come back in? I think, to be fair, Councillor Maitland indicated she wanted to come in. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Maitland. OK. Um, right. Well, I, I've listened to what uh, members have to say, and, and I'm persuaded that this is not the correct, <laughs> forgive the pun, direction of travel. Um, we really shouldn't be um, setting up even, I think, frankly, the, um, the faintest possibility of conflict um, between cycling and pedestrian ways and going against our active travel policies. Um, I'm not absolutely certain um, with respect to um, um, the policies that I need to use in, in, to refuse this, but, but I would simply say on, on grounds of road safety and possible conflict, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not happy with this at all. I think it's absolutely inappropriate and we should not be doing it. Um, so I'll leave that um, <laughs> for other members to, 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 to tell me what they think. Thanks very much. I'm sure you'll get a formal words uh, when we come to that uh, position. Councillor Thompson, do you wish to come back in on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, again, it's, it's how best to couch that in planning terms. I, th I don't think road safety is... It might be sufficient, but I don't know if it's, um, it says all that we want to say in terms of our position on active travel. However, I don't know. I, I think maybe David may be able to help which particular policy might, might lend weight to that. But, um, but again, happy to hear what other members have to say. Thanks very much. I'll come to David later on. Uh, I see uh, Councillor Dryborough. You wish to come in? Yeah, th thanks very much, Chair, and uh, I do have the same concerns as, as, as Jane and, and Stephen with regards, you know, crossing a, an active travel route, whether it be pedestrian or, or cyclist. But I have the same issue as um, Stephen with regarding what what can you put uh, to to refuse this uh, under what policy? Um, and, and road safety is, is, has been used before. However, this is actually on an active travel route, it's, you know, um, and then Stephen said um, they're looking at a, an active travel route at the other side of Moffat, where there's already driveways going across that. So it's it's a it's a difficult one to uh, round the square peg, as, as they basically say. I think on this one, and and to to be honest, I think we need to go with the recommendations on this one because of of the where, where do you put the refusal in? It's hard to to see where that goes. Thanks very much, Archie. Uh, I'm kind of the same vein as yourself. I mean, where, where do you put the, the objections on that particular front? Uh, I mean, I, I can recollect uh, a number of areas, uh, just in Dumfries alone, where uh, there's driveways that cross over footpaths, Lockside, including, for example, and this has been done over a number of years. Uh, fair enough, they're not uh, cycle routes, but uh, there's, there is an element of road safety in that, I would imagine, but uh, I don't know if David wants to come in and maybe assist members here in uh, taking this forward. David. Uh, thank you, Chair. There's really two policies in LDP which address issues of uh, transportation accessibility and so on. Policy T2, which is location of development of the accessibility, that's really a proposal that you would use for looking for identifying sites or for making sure that very large uh, development sites have suitably addressed all the, the road safety issues. I think the only one you could potentially hang anything on is policy OP1, development considerations under E, transport and travel, which... Um, the whole thing is development proposals should minimise the need for travel by car and encourage active and other more sustainable forms of travel without avoiding or mitigating any adverse impact on the uh, transport network or road safety. So I think the only way that you could come up with something on that is there. The, the advice, um, you, you may wish to bring Laura on this from a legal perspective, perspective is obviously if you were minded to go for refusal the council's 
Roads Officer has not objected to this, so a refusal of the committee would be entitled to go to appeal. You then have the situation where you have no backing from officers or indeed uh, from the, the, the Roads Officer either. But um, certainly, if, if you are minded to go for refusal, I think OP1E is the only one you could reasonably hang it on. Thanks very much, David. That's been quite helpful. I don't know if Laura wants to come in at this stage. Um, happy to provide advice, Chair. Um, where committee goes against officers' recommendations, if it is appealed, obviously that has got expense um, attached to it um, because historically we've employed external solicitors in those matters where it's been a committee going against officer recommendation. Um, so, as David says, it would be best to be absolutely robust in what planning um, grounds you're, you're utilising. Thanks very much. Uh, so, I think uh, Councillor Dryborough uh, wants to go with the recommendations. Uh, the officer's recommendations. I didn't quite hear if there was a an actual motion to go to refusal. Jane, was yours an actual motion put forward? Just looking for the right sort of words to form. Is that correct? Definitely, definitely, Chairman. Yes, ab absolutely. I, I'm. You no, know, I, I think it's. In this in this day and age, um, and um, and I do accept that what the um, the, the council's um, solicitor advice is giving us, but nevertheless, um, I didn't get the impression that the roads officer was absolutely enthusiastic about it, and I think I think actually tepid might uh, describe his his enthusiasm for this. Um, so OP one E, um, I think, is what was being suggested: transport and travel. Um, we are um, th th this proposal does not encourage active and more sustainable transport. It really doesn't, and um, because it's going to uh, cross um, walking, it's going to make it at the margins. It's going to make it less desirable if people think that they're going to be um, uh, obstructed by cars crossing in front of their path or or across in terms of safety. So I, I think I'm quite happy to go along with that and suggest that we refuse it on those on that basis, OP1E, um, uh, because the proposal does not encourage active and sustainable travel. Thanks uh, very much, Councillor Maitland. Uh, I take it, Stephen, you're happy to second Councillor Maitland's motion? Um, yeah, I mean, it does acknowledge that there would be um, conflict potentially at the school pick-up and drop-off points, but. Um, I think I think if the safest ground is to go with OP1E, then I'm happy to second on that basis. Thanks very much. Uh, Archie, are you still happy to go with the recommendations? Yes, yeah. Uh, well, I'm happy to second that, Archie. So we have a, a motion and amendment. Uh, I'll let Tracy sort out which one's which, if you don't mind taking us through. Oh, uh, I've got Ivor. Sorry, Ivor, I didn't see you coming up on the chat there. Chair, it's just a piece of information before I make my mind up. Within the Council Roads Officers uh, Consultation Response, paragraph 2.2b, the last part of the sentence in the paragraph says, this may not warrant grounds for objection. That's a sort of woolly... Uh, way of addressing things. Usually this does not or this does is something that you would have a solid answer to, but this is sort of really in the fact that is does he have concerns or is the way it's written there a sort of paraphrase by the officers or is that the actual roads officer's wording? Uh, thanks, Councillor Hislop. I'll, I'll ask uh, Beth uh, if she can maybe explain a wee bit about Paragraph B. Beth? Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, that was the wording of it. That was the, the roads officer's wording of it. Is that, <clears throat> does that help, Ivor? Yes, thank you. Okay, so, uh, Councillor Thompson. 
Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm caught between my, my hand and my keyboard. Um, I think with that, I mean, that to me, that leaves it sufficiently open to interpretation that if Councillor Maitland's minded, I'd be happy to include that there is, uh, an, you know, a potential risk of a road safety um, impact, given what the roads officer has said inconclusively, it leaves it open to interpretation. And I think it's up to us members to interpret that. Um, I don't know if Councillor Maitland would be happy to add that as a second reason for refusal. Councillor Maitland, are you quite content with what uh, Councillor Thompson said there? Very, very happy with that. Uh, I think there is quite enough room for doubt there. Thank you. Okay, members, uh, we've got a motion and an amendment. Uh, Tracy, could you take us through that, please? What the motion and amendment is, and we'll go to the vote. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. So, a motion proposed by Councillor Maitland, seconded by Councillor Thompson, is to refuse the application on the grounds that the proposal is contrary to P policy OP1E, as this proposal does not minimise the need for travel by car or encourage active or other more sustainable forms of travel, and does not avoid or mitigate any ad adverse impacts on the transport network or road safety. Is that sufficient to include the road safety there? Because that is mentioned in OP1E. Yeah. Thanks. And the amendment proposed by Councillor Driver, seconded by uh, the Chair, is to approve the application subject to the conditions detailed in the report. Chairman. Amendment. Councillor Blake. <coughs> I'll come back to Councillor Blake. Uh, Councillor Crothers. Amendment. Councillor Driver. Amendment. Councillor Drysdale. Amendment. Councillor Fairbairn. Amendment. Councillor Hislop. Motion. Councillor Lever. Motion. Councillor McKee. Hey, sorry, Maitland. Motion. Councillor Martin. Motion. Councillor Thompson. Motion. Councillor Young. Motion. Councillor Blake. He's left the meeting now, Chair. And the motion carries uh, six votes to five, so the application has been refused. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you, members. Thank you, Beth, uh, for your presentation as well. I don't have any other business, so uh, those of you at home have a safe journey back to the kitchen for your dinner, Jane, <laughs> and uh, those of us here uh, have a safe journey home. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.